Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Hey, this is uh, Jonathan, the uh, flight instructor in Iowa. Oh, hey, how's it going? Hey. Hey, good. Hey, this is uh, calling in to check in with the uh, the previous caller. They got called in about the flying. I uh, I had to call in and, and uh, make my comment on a couple things. Please. Uh, definitely can do a test with airplanes, um, and I'm definitely in for doing that. If anybody comes up with something they want to test, um, we've got access. We've got the airplanes to do it. I'd love to do something. Um, so if you guys come up with any good tests, let me know. Um, and we can definitely navigate without the GPS. Totally doable, oh, not a problem. Uh, yeah, you know, 100 miles, 200 miles, whatever we need to do. That's, that's crazy. All right, then. Dude, you're rich. You have a private jet, I'm sure. <laughs> like, come on, let's do this. But, yeah. uh, no, we don't need a big fancy jet. We can do it with a small airplane. And, um, we could, we could, yeah, the cost wouldn't be hardly anything at all. We can, uh, we can work that out. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to do it. I think it'd be great to get a test out there. I've been thinking about doing it, but um, I just don't know exactly what to test on. I mean, I see it every day, so it's hard for me to kind of, I don't know what people want to see, you know. Where do you stand right now? Are you uh, still believing in the globe, or do you think... No, no, <laughs> no. I, I, I just... <laughs> no, uh, uh, my, both myself and my girlfriend are flight instructors, and we teach people to fly, and we were both, just in the last two days, we both came back from separate flights with students, and we both came back, and we're like, it was a really clear day, and we both said to each other, you know, wow, you know, we can see so much that we should not be able to see. We can see wind farms that are... Uh, 50 miles away that should be uh, if we did the math it should be 500 feet below the um, horizon from where we were viewing them at we're not up really high we're only a thousand feet off the ground and uh, we, it's, we see it all the time it's it's obvious and wow. our instrumentation stays level so no it's amazing it's pretty yep. clear to us i know i want to go to amazon and see if there's a uh, a gyro that because that's a well that's our that's our that's our uh, gyro that we have in the aircraft you know i mean it, right. it's there it's working it's just the problem is you can't get any information and i've tried to track that down as well um, I did a bunch of research trying to find the uh, how the gyros are made, what you know, the internal components, and you cannot find anything out about them. They're just yeah. their perfect devices. They're, they're, and that's why they always show you exactly where you're at, but they don't take into account. Hey, I should be upside down on the ball, or hey, I should have. <laughs> I'm on sideways, or exactly, they exactly. Uh, yeah, they have no correction for for the for gravity or anything like that. They're independent. So start here uh, and come back here. Uh, and I've gotten calls like crazy from other pilots. They'll call me, you know. And uh, and I've talked with lots of other pilots, professional pilots, guys, airline guys that are retired out, and they they all admit to it. They all say, "Yep." They said they've seen the same things, and they said the problem is you're never going to get a current airline guy to admit it because risk of losing their job. job. You know, um, yeah, I'm self-employed. I do my own thing. I'm not afraid to say what I want to say about it. But uh, but yeah, so I mean, the, the, it, we all believe it. All my friends uh, that are pilots, they're all we all agree on it. It's not. The airline guys that are retired out and they they all admit to it they all say yep they said they've seen the same things and they said the problem is you're never going to get a current airline we all believe it all my friends uh, that are pilots they're all we all agree on it the airline guys that are retired out and they they all admit to it they all say yep they said they've seen the same things and they said the problem is you're never going to get a current airline we all believe it all my friends uh, that are pilots they're all we all agree on it Y luego, además, aquí aparece como si fuera, no sé cómo le llamamos a esto, un, un anexo, un añadido, algo que se cose. Sí, exactamente, un parchecito, ¿Un que, parchecito? que me recuerda a una persona muy especial. Explícate, si la Tierra desde las alturas se ve... Eh, plana y estacionaria, se ve. ¿Plana? ¿Sí? ¿Y eh, no tiene algo de achatamiento? ¿No se ve el...? ¿No? Eso es cuando ya la nos vamos a la órbita, ¿no? La curvatura se ve... Cuando la cámara es de ojo de, de pez, como la que llevaba el que se tiró de Red Bull, sí. ahí sí que ves la curvatura, pero si la cámara es una cámara normal, se ve todo recto. ¿A cuántos permiten volar el máximo de altura? Normalmente volamos a lo máximo, el techo del avión es 41.000 pies, que son 12 kilómetros, 800 metros o algo así, sí. pero normalmente volamos a 35, 37, que son altura, no se ve? 10... La curvatura. No, hombre, no, según... Eh, a ver, yo he volado con el Lier a 47.000 pies, con el Lier del jet privado, que son unos 13 kilómetros, 600 o algo así, y tampoco. Tampoco. ¿Tierra plana? Sí, ¿por qué? Porque a, al margen de la forma geométrica de la Tierra, que puede ser un geoide, un globito, o obviamente plana y estacionaria, la tendencia de la Tierra plana es buscador de la verdad. 
buscador de la verdad más allá de lo que me digan en Antena 3 o en Tele 5 o en 4 o en la 1. Yo quiero saber qué hay detrás de quién paga la tinta de quién ah, paga esa iluminación, ah, amigo. quién está detrás. Entonces, ellos no te lo van a decir nunca. Claro. Nunca te van a decir que han aprobado la nueva ley de seguridad nacional. Esto no te lo van a decir. Ellos no. En el cual, si el de Estado declara un estado de emergencia, puede hacer el fruto de ti y de tus bienes. Seguro. Si te lees el BOE todos los días, sí que lo vas a leer. Pero hoy en día, muchachos, el BOE está complicado de que no lo leamos. No me leo el marca. Y eso que gana Nadal, voy a leer el BOE. Cierto. Oye, por tanto, el baloncesto es una evasión. Es una evasión. Es un altavoz y es mi bebé. Yo lo cuido e intento cuidar el aspecto deportivo en el cual delego en mi director deportivo y en mi entrenador, el aspecto de gestión y intento cuidar mi bebé todo lo posible, desde el diseño de la camiseta hasta eh, los aficionados que tenemos en Instagram, que es Basket Frater, el trato, nos piden camisetas para nuestros aficionados, etcétera, etcétera. Y todo a pulmón. Yo creo que ya el hecho de haber creado el club ya es motivo de, de victoria. Efectivamente. Sí. Con 45 años, ¿cómo se mira el futuro? Uy, es que, es que yo tengo muy claro que hay que disfrutar de cada segundo ahora. Es decir, estás en las alturas, o más allá de las alturas, uh -huh. pero con los pies muy bien puestos en el suelo, en la tierra. Yo creo que Por sí. Por eso la tierra es plana. Y estacionaria. Y estacionaria. <risa> <risa> qué bueno, qué bueno. been a military brat all my life. However, I've been in the industry of aviation for the last 21 years. And I became an FE somewhere around 15 or 16 when I really started looking at conspiracies. Uh, I looked into Benghazi because I happened to work on government contracts abroad, overseas. But I've been in aviation for 21 years. Anything from helicopters to aerostats to big birds, little birds, fighter jets, Things with engines, no engines, big blades, little blades, compressor blades, which, by the way, that one's not a hoax. Jets do not run only on compressed air. Contrary to popular belief, it takes compressed air in a blended ratio of air to fuel to drive the now heated gas and rotate the compressor blades. This has been a topic of discussion between FE and, you know, not everything's a hoax. Coriolis effect, with that ties into obviously with no spin around the access points that they say exist at 23.4 conveniently, 66 off the, the 90 degrees, right? Everything ties into 666 with NASA and all the BS scientists. Our aircraft have things called ADIs, attitude direction indicator, which gives correlation between the aircraft housing or the shell around the gyro itself. The ADI is nothing more than a gyro that will always reference level. I don't care what any pilot says. I don't care what any mechanic tells you. You know, there's a reason that pilots have one book called a pilot operating handbook. And there's every other book, right? From structures to avionics, to wiring diagrams, to the actual components that make up these systems. That is a standalone system. The ADI does not lie. You don't care how cold it is how high you are and some of these guys are pretty damn high it doesn't matter where you're going it doesn't matter where you've been it doesn't matter where you are over the realm itself as far as adis in every aircraft it references the level horizon or references sea level always there's no way that you can convince somebody of sound mind that if you take off from new york and immediately flip upside down now your housing or your adi is referencing upside down to you because you're upside down it's right side up it cannot deviate off level it doesn't matter how much fuel you got in your tanks it doesn't matter if you're a helicopter or an aerostat or a fighter jet that gauge will always reference level it has to Because otherwise it would be a pull reference. And if you could manipulate it, why would you even have it in the airplane or your aircraft? But if you go and take off two miles away, do a barrel roll, you're now flying upside down. At what point does that gauge show you back right side up? A half a hemisphere away? Is that what, is that what we're led to believe? Is that what we're supposed to believe? 
at what point does it does it right itself if you never flipped back over and continue flying level you, know, you see what I'm saying it's, it's, it's ridiculous it's ludicrous to think that that thing compensates for curvature in straight and level flight interesting side note I worked on aerostats for several years and I always ask people who try to bring up gravity well how come my 4,000 pound 74,000 cubic foot aerostat isn't getting pushed towards ground it weighs more than you do, which you believe gravity is pushing you down, right? Because these are some dense ass people. But how come the aerostat's not getting driven into the ground? It weighs more. It's definitely larger than a, you know, the size of a house. It's more than most size of most houses. You know, so why is it getting driven to the ground? Well, that's because it's displacing less weight than the atmosphere or the medium that it's in. And I try explaining that. I don't know how many times you've probably posted something on this. I don't know how many times we're going to have to post something on this. But every time that little kid lets go of that helium balloon, it starts crying. But truth be told, I've been to many countries, done many things, all things aviation. I can say with absolute certainty, and I can attest, the plane does not dip nose down to follow the curvature of the Earth, ever. Matter of fact, most planes have an airfoil that are three degrees nose up in straight and level flight. And the reason that is, is simple. If the nose of the aircraft was at zero degrees or level flying through the air, then it would porpoise, right? It would be quite a violent because some of the air would go over the nose and some of the air would go under the nose. And it would cause that nose to go up and down, up and down, which is literally like a porpoise or a dolphin out of water. And that's exactly what would happen. So it's the wings are designed when they are level, the nose is three degrees nose up. The fact, three dimensionally, it is two dimensional. It is the amount of deviation that's required for you to come back inward. If you are walking east, from north, meaning you are going around north equidistantly and you walked in a straight line east one mile, you're going to have to deviate eight inches back to the left to, to get back on the equator, right? Look at it on the flat earth map and clearly it makes sense. If you walked one mile in a straight line east, you have to deviate eight inches after each mile to stay on the equator. The eight inches per mile squared is a real measurement. If in fact we consider the equator to be a real place, a real location, ever, always. Is the Earth flat or spherical? It is flat. The Earth is flat or not? <laughs> You know it's flat. You know it's flat. <laughs> How long have you been flying for, you said? Over 30 years. My name is William Andres Lozada. I am a commercial pilot. I make videos for the internet and this is one of the questions they most ask me on social media. Watch this video until the end to know the opinion of a commercial pilot about the flat earth theory. Today from beautiful Puerto Buenaventura, a city on the Pacific, I share my thoughts. I always questioned many things in life and always wanted to go beyond. I believe in the saying that goes like this, a lie repeated 1000 times becomes reality. That's why I decided to hear the opinions and thoughts of millions on people who have interesting theories about flat earth. Even if you don't believe it, there are millions of people who do. Why is that that the famous image of the blue marble has so many modifications in graphic design? Why don't they just take a photograph of the entire Earth from a satellite or something that is in space? Take a photo that shows how it really is. Why do they have to make corrections, graphic designs and CGI? The aircraft I fly can fly up to 25,000 feet altitude. I never saw any curve from up there. Also as a passenger I fly at more than 35,000 feet altitude and I don't see any curve either. During the cruising phase I fly straight and level. I never dip down the nose of the aircraft to adjust for the curvature of the earth. That's it. Okay? Here, never making any correction. Straight and level. The horizon always straight and level. Dipping the nose is not required at all.
¿La Tierra es plana o esférica? Es plana. ¿The Earth is flat or no? <laughs> I know it's flat. You know it's flat. <laughs> How long have you been flying for, you said? Over 30 years. Soy William Andrés Lozada, piloto comercial, hago videos para internet y esta es una de las preguntas que más me hacen en redes sociales. Quédense al final para ver la opinión de un piloto comercial acerca de la teoría de la tierra plana. Hoy desde el bonito puerto de Buenaventura, una ciudad del Pacífico, eh, he traído un pensamiento y es que siempre me he cuestionado muchas cosas en la vida y siempre he querido ir un poco más allá. Pues yo soy fiel a la frase que una mentira repetida mil veces se vuelve una verdad. Por eso he decidido escuchar las voces y pensamientos de millones de personas que tienen teorías interesantes acerca de la tierra plana. Y aunque ustedes no lo crean, son millones de personas. ¿Por qué la famosa eh, fotografía Blue Marble o la canica azul? ¿Por qué tiene correcciones de diseño gráfico? O sea, ¿por qué simplemente no le toman una fotografía desde un satélite o desde una, algo que haya ido a, al espacio, le toman una foto y nos la muestran. ¿Por qué tienen que eh, hacerle correcciones eh, de diseñadores gráficos o por computador? Por El avión que yo vuelo puede volar hasta 25.000 pies de altitud y yo nunca he visto la redondez de la Tierra desde ahí. Y también he estado como pasajero a más de 35.000 pies y tampoco he visto la redondez de la Tierra desde ahí. Cuando voy en fase de crucero, que voy recto y nivelado, nunca he tenido que corregir bajando el morro del avión para eh, seguir la curvatura de la tierra. Esto, ok. Ok. En ningún momento toca hacer la corrección a recto y nivelado. El horizonte en todo momento a recto y nivelado. Así no toca hacer correcciones de nariz abajo. My name is Joshua Silva. I am a licensed commercial pilot and flight instructor. I have had a lifelong love of aviation and aerospace. And when growing up, I even fancied myself an amateur astronomer. Um, I would drag my family and friends, anybody I could, to every air show I could possibly find in Northern California. I was the only kid you knew or anybody knew that knew the various components on aircraft, spacecraft by heart. Um, I absolutely loved anything to do that, anything to do with flying or space. But my love of aviation and aerospace never stopped. I continued studying, had an entire library full of aviation books of various military and civilian aircraft, military history, every aviation campaign and theater in almost any war. I studied religiously and it was just out of pure passion. Later in life, many years later, I decided to become a pilot. Um, as strange as it may sound, it hadn't occurred to become a pilot up to that point. I just simply loved aviation and aerospace, but I decided to become a pilot and I began attending a prestigious flight academy in the Midwest and attending university at the same time and to gain a degree in aeronautics and aerospace. Shortly thereafter, I began flying twin turboprop aircraft out of Northern California for several nonprofit organizations. And years after that, I found myself flight instructing for various small flight schools, both in California and in Arizona, and then on to large academies that trained for the airlines and even some military flights. Shortly thereafter, I began flying regional business jets, and that's when the story of me finding the topic of flat earth started. Could the earth actually be flat? I began to see opinions and arguments that seemed logical, but I heard several arguments, which I now know were most likely disinformation, easily disprovable in the aviation world, but there were some that stuck with me. And so, myself, Being the way I am, I ran quickly, metaphorically, to my old textbook and I opened my old textbooks, found them, unpacked them, cracked them all open, and even downloaded new, brand new copies in PDF form offline of all these books to make sure that nothing had been changed. I thought for certain that I knew exactly what 
compensation pilots are trained while flying to compensate for the spin or the rotation of the Earth, for instance. As far as falling around a globe, that assume, I assumed in my mind would be an aircraft's angle of attack, but upon more study I found that not to be true. The angle of attack being the angle between the aircraft's flight path and the relative wind, which is something that pilots are very familiar with, and it's the idea that an aircraft has to be slightly pitched up essentially to stay airborne, or a surface of that aircraft has to be pitched slightly to create a difference in air pressure to hold the aircraft aloft. And that is assumed, or was assumed at, my, at that time by myself and other pilots, to be the compensation one would make for falling around a globe while flying, period. But upon further research, I found that this was not the case, and it was not even mentioned anywhere. This compensation was not mentioned anywhere I could find in any resource that I had gone to flight school with. And they were extensive. There were many, many books, especially as one progressed towards the commercial flying side, especially elective courses, especially if you're going to university as I was studying aerospace, then you would assume, and I had assumed, that this was calculated for. Again, as far the big one that is oftentimes quoted is compensation for Coriolis effect while flying. And this is something I'd even taught my students about, and it's always assumed to be correct. We just assume. We're given the narrative from a young age, and we everything is built upon that assumption, upon that theory. And so I thought I had the, the silver bullet. Ah, Coriolis effect. We always calculate for that. Well, as I began to look through the books and to look into the calculations given for Coriolis effect, the narrative began to fall apart even further. I began to see things I didn't notice when I was in school, such as Coriolis effect is actually never calculated for, but is assumed to be a part of wind correction angle. Wind correction angle is one of the many calculations pilots of all kinds make while flying to correct against winds in whatever volume or section of air they're flying through, which it could be from any direction and you're flying through it so you have to compensate a certain angle into that wind to hold a straight line. And then the big one is given after that, well GPS auto corrects for it. And that sent me down yet another path, GPS auto corrects for it. If it's a satellite based system, how is it correcting for spin if it's also spinning over the same body? And why are there large gaps in GPS coverage over large oceanic bodies? Do they just turn them off? It's just not worthwhile? There have been enough aviation accidents at sea, very far from shore, that would say otherwise. And if you gave the American taxpayers, the ones funding these satellites that are supposed to track aircraft, the information that, well, we're just shutting them off because it's not worthwhile, those three or four Jets full of hundreds of passengers just have to use other navigation methods such as dead reckoning, which is basically using a stopwatch and guessing to the next checkpoint, essentially. If you were to tell them that, they would be infuriated. So that could not be the case. Coverage was a problem. Even over large and non-densely populated areas, you would lose GPS coverage, even in jets at times. So this began to unravel the thread of satellites and satellite timing and the fact that many reels of footage show these satellites being launched by balloon rather than by rockets. How the concept of these rockets doesn't even work to make it pass the atmosphere, much less leave something in perfect geosynchronous orbit. I actually had the privilege of working a short time at a satellite manufacturing company in Northern California. Got to see the assembly and participate in the assembly of satellites. Base, base satellites or so they are said, there would be small bottles encased in these structures that were encased by another structure. The small bottles were the fuel cells. These fuel cells were incredibly small, smaller than a diver's tank in most cases, much smaller. And this was supposed to be all the fuel that the craft needed to run and operate, as most are not actually electric, they're becoming electric now, and sustain itself in a perfect orbit by just small bursts from its engine or its propulsion system. The narrative began to fall, fall apart. I would continue studying and finding that what I fear to be true is reality, that we have been lied to about just about everything. 
Upon researching military history and then military training and speaking with military gunners in both the Army and the Marine Corps that I know personally, I would ask them about Coriolis effect. And it was always assumed that, yeah, we, we compensate for the Earth being, you know, a curve, uh, the cur that it would drop. We, we, we calculate for the Earth curvature. But even upon asking and having them look into their materials further and my own personal study, again, it found to be an assumed truth with no actual basis in reality that they would calculate bullet fall based upon angular velocity, drop, friction, amongst other things. And curvature was supposed to be just corrected along with it, just like flying wind correction angle corrected for Coriolis effect. controversial. Hay un debate ahora en YouTube especialmente Ajá. en el que la, las personas se cuestionan que si la curvatura de la Tierra es observable o no es observable. No, a las alturas que vuelan esos aviones. Usted no lo... Siempre. No va haciendo ningún ajuste, va como si fuera parejito, sí. sobre terreno No, no, pero sí plano. tiene unos dos grados a, más altos que, que normal, depende de lo que, del, del test de la vía. Vale. Ah, ok, la nariz va, va hacia arriba. Sí. Pero no tienen que buscar no. la curvatura. No. no. Vuela como si fuera sobre un sí. plano. Sí, es lo que hace lo que hace el avión. Bueno, muchas pero, gracias, pero Mucho gusto. Ok, bien. Pues, hasta luego. Anyhow, you know, uh, I've been getting hit with these, you know, questions regarding the flat world and uh, trying to get information out of me that I'm not too familiar with the subject. Uh, help me out. Yes, sir. Copy that. I'll give you a couple of relatively quick examples that you can also research and elaborate as well. Uh, number one, you know, I'm a pilot, and when I used to fly out of Long Island towards Nantucket, Bottom line here is they're going to give you some type of formula for every hundred miles. They're going to give you some type of X, Y, Z per kilometer squared. Keep it very, very simple. Every hundred miles would be approximately one mile. One mile is 5,280 feet. The actual number is 6666, which you know, is of Luciferian origin, which really reveals who's behind all the conspiracy and cover-ups you know, for everything. But the bottom line here is a very simple formula is for every 100 miles, you have 5,280 feet, which is one mile of curvature. So 100 miles equals one mile of curvature. Now, if I'm going, let's say, hypothetically, from Long Island to Nantucket, that's about a buck and a half. It's about 150 miles. So it should be a mile and a half. So let's just take a mile. So with aviation, you fly at certain altitudes, whether you're flying in a easterly and northeasterly to a southwesterly direction. So, hypothetically, if I'm flying easterly at hypothetically 40, about 4,000 feet, which is an even number, if you add 5,000 feet of curvature, that would be around 9,480 feet, which does not exist. So, the bottom line is, pilots know every 100 miles that you travel, you would be dipping the nose down to the state for one mile, which is 5,280 feet of curvature. So there's the proof right there that there's something very fishy with this globe Earth situation because scientifically it doesn't matter. Uh, also, there's a semi-classified naval communication device. When ships are communicating ship to ship on the ocean, U.S. Navy, semi-classified laser communication, NAVCOM device, which also does data as well. So. If they're communicating with ships 70 miles, 100 miles or more, like I said, every 100 miles is a mile curvature. 
So it wouldn't work because lasers operate line of sight. They operate in a straight line. There's no curvature to the laser. So the bottom line here is the Naval NAVCOM classified, semi-classified that they use to communicate ship to ship. That operates on a laser, and if there was curvature, anything over, like I said, 100 miles is 5,280 feet of curvature, and the ship's diameter is nowhere near that, which, which you know. So there's another example, the Naval NAVCOM communication device. Uh, also, there's a woman, a uh, female KLH pilot, KLH uh, Dutch commercial airlines. She got fired from her job a while back for questioning this issue. Now, they didn't throw her out of the company, but they gave her like a desk job, so this way they kind of keep her out of quiet and they control. But she's a very sane and rational woman. If they ask her, you know, what happened, she starts talking, it's going to raise serious questions. So we got the KLH pilot, we got the Laser NAVCOM, U.S. Navy. Uh, we've got my personal experience flying from Long Island to Dan Park. This would be at least 5,280 feet curvature, added to the 4,000 altitude average while heading easterly. So there's something very wrong there. The numbers don't work. The Globers definitely scientifically were looking at flat earthers have some very, very, very valid points according to those three examples. You got it, brother. Anything else? Well, that about answers my question. Uh, quite a lot to take in. I've taken some notes. Thank you. Thank you again. You're welcome, sir. Any questions? I'll be here for a while. Contact me anytime. All right. God bless. All the best. God bless. How did you first get into Flat Earth? How did you first start looking into it? Yeah, well, actually, I was just, um, uh, since 2003, mm -hmm. I was looking into the f uh, business mm -hmm. because my son, uh, um, he's now 13, uh, he got ver very ill from the f He had a, 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 how do you call that, a brain uh, oh yeah, yeah, like injury. a injury. Yep, sure. So um, that's how I got, you know, onto the internet mm -hmm. at 2003, and I was reading about uh, a lot and um, yeah, figuring things out. Were how, how long have you been a, uh, in the airline industry? Um, actually, uh, I got my license in '91. So uh, I, I've been with uh, the, the company that I'm at now, which is actually the best uh, in, the, in, the, in Holland. There are not so many, but right. uh, they're a very good company. And uh, I, I'm with them uh, for 22 years now. Yeah. And then yeah. started going down conspiracies, saw a couple things that had to do with flat earth and gyroscopes and thought, hmm, this is sort of interesting. Yeah. So, did did you start poking around uh, in your inside your company? Did you like yes, were there friends? Friends yeah, of yours? Yeah, so I I was just because you know there are lots of things that we are taught about you know the spinning Earth, mm -hmm. and I I told to my uh, colleagues because of course you think about it, but then you just discard it about how it is possible that uh, the the atmosphere spins with the. Um, with the globe, mm -hmm. and then of course, well, that might be gravity, and then it says, well, then you have to, uh, it has to spin faster at a higher altitude because there's no, there's no gra gradual uh, difference. Right. So I thought, well, that's kind of strange, and also the the speed at which the Earth should spin around the equator. I thought, well. That's almost the, the speed of sound, so that's kind of strange. And then also when you fly, let's say, from Johannesburg to Amsterdam, mm -hmm. there is no, we don't have to account for the difference, you know, and also not uh, because it spins then at a different rate, and it doesn't also, uh, you know, we don't also have to account for the difference in altitude that it, that it spins. So yeah, yeah. I thought, this is so strange. And now, actually, I, <laughs> I I told the other day to uh, to uh, stewardess because she has an open mind, and now I have to work on the ground. I said, well, actually, I'm a little bit uh, um, ashamed of 
you know, believing all this shit. And I should have, you know, questioned before because my IQ isn't actually good enough <laughs> to, um, you know, question how does a gyroscope work actually because it does not, you know, measure the uh, the gravity. Everybody in the flyers community has had to relearn a lot yeah. of scientific premises just just so we could catch up and then tear it down and gyroscopes is one of them. actually gyroscopes helped us a whole bunch i didn't know how to how gyroscopes i mean we've seen of course and and we yeah. you know we spin things around and we kind of get the the feel for them but how they relate to the earth spinning oh yeah most people don't know so anyway sorry yeah. continue yeah. please so you were looking into the gyroscopes and then what yeah, uh, and then of course I also saw the um, movies from Eric Dubay yep. about Rising Horizon. Yep. Horizon. Yep. And I thought, well, yeah, that's true. And we do fly at forty thousand feet, forty-one thousand feet sometimes. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've been. Uh, this is now almost uh, a year going on that I was, uh, you know, that I uh, that I started look that I started looking for the um, for the curve, let's say, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, of course I couldn't find it, and and I saw the horizon, you know, rising with us, and it was flat wherever I looked, and I thought, well, shit, why did I <laughs> so <laughs> didn't see this before? And then I started questioning in the cockpit, you know, do you know that the uh, that the uh, atmosphere spins at the uh, at the same speed? Uh, as the uh, so the speed of sound at the equator, and then I get this strange look on their faces. You know, when whenever I would ask something like that, but it bothered me so much that I, I thought, well, I, yeah, it ha this has to you know go sure. out there, and and I thought, well, you can just discuss these things, but obviously not. Uh, we were with the three of us in the cockpit, and uh, the the captain he was in training. And the instructor was on the uh, jump seat, and uh, we had a night stop in um, uh, Zurich. And um, the last day that we uh, actually flew from Zurich uh, to Amsterdam, uh, they said, "Well, did you actually mean those things that you said about uh, flat Earth and everything?" I said, "Yes, I do." And they say, "Well, we think you are retarded." <laughs> and they didn't actually say yeah. that, did they? Yeah, they did. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and uh, you are, uh, how do you call that? Uh, labile. I don't know if, if what, what that is in uh, English, actually. Um, but it's it's like you are mentally unstable. Oh, no, that's <laughs> that's like pretty, that. yeah, yeah. So you're kind yeah. of, they. so who said this to you? Uh, that actually said, the instructor said that to me. He said, really? Well, actually, yeah, because I did not go out to dinner with them because... Um, I could already, you know, sense that there was no match between uh, the three of us. Right. So uh, I did not go out with dinner to the, uh, with them uh, at the, uh, the the night stop. And uh, he said, well, we had a discussion, a discussion between the two of us about you. And uh, we think you are, uh, well, retarded, but the, then the, the Dutch word for that. <laughs> and, uh, and mentally unstable, so... Um, I said, well, if you think uh, think like that, and we only had like 20 minutes left or so, mm -hmm. I, I suggest that you come sit in my seat, because I knew he was, uh, you know, an instructor, and he could sit in both uh, seats, because you're, um, as an instructor, you need to, need to be able to, you know, sit in both seats. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, well, you better sit here, because I'm not going to fly any longer with you guys. So what so happened... After Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So we land. They landed, and I sit in the in the jump seat. And I said, "Well, you know, guys, uh, we get we we really uh, get a lot of training uh, with uh, with our company <laughs> about uh, how to communicate uh, amongst um, each other because uh, lots of uh, errors happen when the com uh, communication the cockpit is not working out. <laughs> so we get a lot of training about that." I said, well, guys, all the things that we di discussed yesterday, because I don't know how the topic came up, but uh, we discussed about those trainings, about the things we shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. You both did. Like, um, we call that OMA. The O is for... Um, <laughs> 
uh, oordelen, dit, dat is uh, to judge. Aha. Um, die M is voor um, uh, mening, dat uh, uh, is opinion, mm-hmm. an opinion. En E is voor aanname, en dat means uh, to um, as- assume. Uh-huh. So I said, well, those things you both did without even questioning me. You just, you know. The, yeah, their natural reaction was to out. think it's like, yeah, you, get, you know, flat, yeah. flat Earth yeah. is ridiculous, yeah. so we're, we're going to judge you right here and right now. Yeah, yeah. So I did not even have, you know, you did not even ask me one question like, I mean, I, I was educated the way you were. I mean, but you could have asked me, well, Lydia, what? H- how do you come to such a such a strange viewpoint or whatever? You know, you could have asked me some question it, instead of just throwing me out. Mm-hmm. And um, well, the uh, instructor said, well, I'm sorry about that. Um, and actually, he got tears in his eyes, so I was a little. Um, <laughs> I was a little moved by that because I thought, well, yeah, okay, uh, I came on quite strong actually because well, I was mad, of course, and I and he also was relieved because I said, well, uh, when I stepped out of my uh, seat, I said, well, I will see you uh, in the uh, in the office, I guess, mm-hmm. because I assume because we have to write about these things if, if things like this happen. Uh, I thought, well, he's an instructor. He's going to write about this. So I thought, well, and when uh, and when you mean write about it, you mean our our term would be like filing a report. File a report. So yeah, you correct. so we, you, at this point, you're thinking of filing a report against your your co-pilots, your fellow your fellow pilots for. Well, he thought I was going to do that because that's what I said when I stepped out of my seat uh, earlier. I said, well, I'm, I think I'm going to see you then in in the office. Yeah. Because I assumed, because he's the instructor, that he would, you know, he was the one who was, you know, trashing me. So I thought, mm-hmm. well, he he will probably write about it. So um, after the landing, I said, well, oh, he asked, he was scared. He said, are you going to uh, write about it? I said, well, no, I'm not going to write about it, but I'm going going to go straight to the doctor's office or from uh from the company, mm-hmm. and um, I'm going to ask for some uh, support in this. So he, then he was really relieved. Well, I'm go- not going to write about it either. <laughs> I said, well, do whatever you please. So uh, so both of you disca- mutually agreed not to file a report on each other about an argument that had to do with Flat Earth. Probably a good thing at the time. Yeah. So yeah. then you, d- yeah. you went to the company physician, the company doctor, yeah. and... You have more or less. You have you. Did you request to them? You said, "Look, I don't think I should fly anymore because I don't believe the Earth is a globe." Well, actually, I called in sick. Okay. And um, I made an appointment, mm-hmm. and then I went to um, the doctor because I thought, well, I you know I have all the evidence there is. So he said he didn't even. You know, because I started to explain to him how I got to the point of thinking flat Earth, because you know it needs a little bit of an introduction, I guess. Oh yeah, you can't so, just come out and say it and be like, no, you no. Know, like metaphorically, or <laughs> what, what are we talking about here? <laughs> so his his response was, um, okay, Lydia, I'm gonna send you to the uh, psychiatrist. Yep, I was I was I waiting for that. <laughs> yeah. I will hold your uh, medical license, and you cannot fly for now. <laughs> so, so technically, are you still working for the company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Have you company. been? You haven't been suspended without pay or anything like that. No, 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 no. That's not the the, the thing they would, you know. Would but did you request? that you wanted you didn't want to fly anymore or did they say you shouldn't fly anymore and i mean obviously you're not flying yeah. at the moment no no i said i cannot fly at this moment because i'm tired of all the lying okay and i'm just exhausted and i'm you know i feel humiliated humiliated and everything and i think we should look into this <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm and when, when, when was this? When was it? Into in this, but they, they just 
they just don't they're not open-minded oh hey look pilots are it's a tough i mean i've talked to a handful of pilots already but this is one of my got to be one of my favorite stories because well and, and sorry i gotta back up a little bit when did this happen uh this happened in march okay this happened in march and did you after that did you see a psychiatrist the company psycho or, yeah or? i had to yeah okay yeah and they 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 made me <laughs> so uh, i went i had to go two times okay and uh, the first time the uh, psychiatrist explained that i had a right a recht van aanhouden and that means that uh, you don't uh, you you get the last say in whether the report goes to your company or not oh i got it. you get the clo you get the closing remarks got it yeah okay. so okay you can send the, the uh, i can read the report and if i'm not uh, you know happy with uh, it yeah happy with it then uh, i can say well no don't send it oh really that's wow that's way that's yeah. way more flexible than we, what we have over here <laughs> I, seriously, a psychiatrist could understand. literally put you in a jacket and, and lock you in a room, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have yeah. much of an opinion. But yeah. anyway, so go ahead. So um, I sat there, and I want to, you know, explain a little bit how I came where I, I am. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't interested. He said, well, no, I don't want to hear all those things. I just want you, because, you know, with my son and everything, I, I you know... It's kind of a long story, but, you know, I wanted to explain to him how I got where I am, and he just was not interested. He said, well, Lydia, you are being a little bit naive in, you know, trying to uh, to convince this guy. Even, well, not, <laughs> you know, not... It, well, why why aren't, aren't men a little bit more courageous? I think I, I'm always more courageous than everybody I meet. It's just... I don't know. I don't understand. Uh, maybe I'm I'm not that, you know, I mean, I just moved to a real nice house and everything, and I thought, well, I might have to say goodbye to this within a year because I don't know what's going to happen. Sure. But, okay, I'm fine with that. I mean, who cares? You are a I'll brave, brave person, yeah. Lydia. There's a lot of people that wouldn't have. But at the yeah. same time, you're in a unique position because pilots you know they they deal with that perspective all the time mm -hmm. most pilots don't know what to do with the information even when they get it because of their conditioning so yeah when you're in the cockpit at 40,000 feet you see a flat horizon and you see it every single day you fly but mm -hmm. there's this weird conflict that happens it's like well mm -hmm. uh, it's a globe because I'm told it's a globe but I only see flat so you know what I'm just gonna land the plane and try to live my life as, as quickly as possible yeah. that's, that's correct yeah yeah so you went to the psychiatrist a couple times did you like the report he wrote or did you not well well the second time that I uh, went he yes. said well Lydia you don't even have to uh, start talking because I'm not interested I think you know where this is going mm -hmm. um, I said well yeah he said well uh, I will uh, um, I think it's it's called delusion or something like that in, in English. And we have another name for that in Dutch. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, okay. I said, you didn't even have a, gla a glance at anything I, I'm, I'm here for. And nope. nope. He said, well, I, nope. <laughs> I am uh, aware of conspiracy theories, he said. And he said that chuckling, so he was laughing. And I thought, okay, well, whatever. So I was actually pissed and I went <laughs> home <laughs> and um, while I was in the train because it was a train ride of about two hours I thought you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not gonna even wait for the report because what's going to be in there nothing that I need to know right so I emailed him right away when I got home I said well dear mr. Huppel the pip uh, I don't need your report don't even bother writing it because I'm gonna you know you're gonna veto uh, it basically so then what so you go back to work so at that point no you... no no because they they have my medical license uh, you know uh, on hold okay or whatever or, so yeah. technically you're on medical we call it medical leave so you were you're you're currently at that time you were on the ground not getting up in a plane again because they said there's a, a medical issue yeah correct okay. that's still the case and now i'm working on the ground because they say well 
uh, okay, you cannot go into the cockpit. But <laughs> I think you can do some other work. Or you should not. Can you just cut that one out because <laughs> I don't want the company name. Uh, got it, got it. I will not say. I will not say your company name. I'll I'll cut that little part out. Yeah. Um. Okay. So they grounded you, but they didn't want to fire you. Yeah, that's not our the way they go about. You know, they just don't fire you like that. I mean. So you haven't flown since March. Correct. Uh, do you have any anticipation that you will be flying? I don't think so. Now, now is that a voluntary thing? Have you been pushing it? Or are you like happy with your desk job and you're like, eh, I'll, I'll just take the desk job for now? Um, well, you know, uh, I found a job where I can uh, meet uh, all kinds of people, but uh, uh, colleagues, and oh. they ask me, why are, not, why are you not flying? So now I have an opportunity to say, well, I have different beliefs <laughs> than most people, you know. So uh, actually, I'm 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 figuring things out, and actually, I want to wear T-shirts, you know, with flowers on it, <laughs> and and uh, just to go to my brown job and um, spread the word. Just spread wow, the word. you yeah. are one of the bravest people I have ever met. I mean that you that's amazing so so now because you're grounded you're now doing the the ground jobs uh, in the yep. airline industry people ask you because once they figure out who you are it's like wait why aren't you flying you tell them yep. you know it's like oh yeah I'm not flying because of and you probably describe what is yep. what's happened to you over the last six months well um, I'm just uh, I, I've just started like four weeks ago Oh, and I only have to come in two times a week because I work 50%, <laughs> so uh, I don't have to go there very often. Yeah. So I just wanted to meet my colleagues there and, you know, uh, get to know them. And But I just I just started. So uh, I, I the last time I was there, I, I said that I believed that and that the moon landings were fake. And actually, there was there are two other pilots also uh, which have some... Uh, some issue why they have to work uh, on the ground because they are something medical <laughs> and um, they laughed at me <laughs> oh I can I can imagine yeah. they would laugh at you yeah. well let me I, I've got to ask you some pointed questions here like one if all of a sudden they came back and they were desperate they needed a pilot would you jump back in or is this something it's like yeah you know what it doesn't really mean much to me anymore uh, no, it it actually didn't mean a lot to me anymore uh, already for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and that had to do with also the fact that I'm a woman in a man's world, and ah, I yeah, got it. Yeah, sometimes you just think, well, if yeah, I'm really open-minded. I mean, that why uh, that's why I you know got into this in the first place. But also, when you are working with people who are totally not, there is hardly any connection, right? And I miss that so. I actually have more fun with with the stewardesses when <laughs> when we are somewhere <laughs> nice. than with my colleagues in the cockpit. So, nice. yeah. So I don't I don't really miss it. Uh, the other day it was really windy. I thought, well, now I miss it because, yeah. Then you can you know uh, practice your skills a little bit and do some really uh, some real flying, and that that's the part that I miss. But the, the whole life around it, I I. So I, I wait a minute, wait a minute. So, do pilots secretly like bad weather, or is this just you? Because <laughs> wind, wind scares the hell out of people. Just so you know. I know. Yeah, but you, I you know. thought it was fine uh, because when it's not when it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, like we do, we do like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> what what part? The landing on a windy runway type thing? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> because it's a what? Well, because it's a challenge. You were just bored. It's yeah, like, oh come yeah, on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Normal landings are so boring that, that pilots just kind of hope for something, you know, like an icy <laughs> runway. Hey, is there some ice on the wings? No, no, yeah. no, 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 no ice. No, no, no. I no, no, like not ice. But wind. That's so tricky. The wind is okay. Yeah. Yeah, but you wouldn't like deliberately try to like try like to fly through some dark clouds or anything. No, it's not. It's not like that. It's not like uh, uh, courageous in that way. No, that's not. That's not the way to go. No, no, no. no. We are very careful. I'm. I'm a very careful person. My children always say, "Well, mom, you drive like a like a snail. Come on, hit the gas." <laughs> I, I can see that. So when you see like a twenty mile an hour crosswind coming in on the runway, you're like, "Ooh, yeah, yeah buckle up." 
this is going to yeah, be fun. Yeah, 20, 20 is nice. Yeah, yeah there's even, hardly anything. I w- I'm sorry, I did a lot of business travel, so now that I know this, this is, this is good. <laughs> this is good stuff. Here. So, you've been in Flat Earth now for, what, less than a year, officially? Yeah, less than a year. Less from than a year. November, yeah. And you've watched a whole ton of videos and read a whole bunch of web pages. Yeah. Is there what's and you, and you probably talk I mean it doesn't sound obviously like you're shy about tell, talking about this with people for you as a pilot or in this case a grounded pilot yeah. uh, what was you but you flew for a lot of years what was the biggest thing for you what you know because everybody for, you know I could talk to 20 different flat, flat earth community members and they'd all have a different answer to this which is what is the one thing that flipped in your head where you were you know half asleep on the couch it's like holy smokes that's it you know yeah, was, the was gyroscope, there... it's just a gyroscope because i thought well it cannot work it cannot work on a on a globe no can't because yeah, yeah and if also you... also the speed of sound at the uh, at the equator those two things that so the core, yeah. So the, the the spinning of the Earth, yeah. The the atmosphere going along with, basically the Coriolis effect. You're not a you're not adjusting the flight path for the Coriolis effect, and you guys are yeah, going right. from north to south a lot. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you you were saying you were flying to Johannesburg from the Netherlands. Well, uh, before I uh, flew the uh, seven three seven, I mm-hmm. flew the MD eleven. Mm-hmm. So then we went. Uh, uh, to um, Kenya, not to and uh, not to Johannesburg. That was just uh, an example that I sure. gave you. But I, I've never been there. But Kenya's but, uh, Kenya's did. fine. That that'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. the middle of, somewhere in the middle of Africa, you guys are flying yeah. from the Netherlands, and not only yeah. did you not have to, because that was a, that's a question. In fact, I might as well ask you this, since we have a hard time asking pilots. We we there's a whole bunch of videos out there uh, where people are trying to ask pilots. When you, you you know how the gyroscope works and you know how the curvature of the Earth works, so yeah. from a pilot standpoint, do you ever see any instruments or do you have to set anything in the cockpit that constantly adjusts for the eight inches per mile squared, or every fifty miles you would have to adjust about seventeen hundred feet? You, no, nothing. Never. No. No, never. The only thing is that I was uh, thinking about, but I also saw that I cannot find it anymore. That's really a pity. Mm-hmm. But um, we have this inertial reference system, and it has uh, like really advanced gyros, the um, the laser ring gyros, mm-hmm. and it has accelerometers on it, mm-hmm. and. Um, you can, um, when something goes wrong with that system, you can reset it and you can have the heading back. Yeah. And, um, but then again, I, I saw this, um, um, this video on uh, YouTube that a guy asked uh, the company, I think it was Honeywell or something, right. um, about uh, resetting and putting the, uh, uh, the right uh, coordinates in. Mm-hmm. And this guy said, "Well, it doesn't really matter. Don't put anything." Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I know that one because that that was a triple seven pilot. I read that one. That's that was me. Okay. Where the triple seven okay. pilot? Okay, so uh, I saw it with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He messaged me and he said the gyroscope compensator that's below the gyroscope is made by a particular company, and there's only this company supplies everybody, and it's a, it's a NASA subcontractor. And the when you and and he went to an airport and it broke, you know, because pieces break every once in a while, and yeah. it broke. And they asked for a repl- he asked for a replacement before he could take off, and they said, you know what, just compensate for it manually. And just because he knew what, what about flat Earth, he decided to ignore that and just wow. make make note of it. And when he was flying, and he basically took a six hour trip, and he never had to. And yeah, he took notes of of what the degree should be, but he never compensated for it. And so yeah. then he was going, okay, what does this thing actually do? If <laughs> if I didn't have to, I just flew uh, six hours and it wasn't yeah. even working. Yeah. And when he tried to, the thing that got me was when he called the company they you know pilots 
as you may know, uh, are, are, are you know, considered very, very wonderful people in the airline industry. So they can go to airline companies. They could walk into Boeing and Boeing is like, yeah, oh, let's, yeah, let's yeah. give you the tour. Right, yeah, and yeah. they wouldn't even talk to this guy. They were like, they was like very, very closed lipped about what these gyroscope compensators would, would even do. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. And, there's a, and this is a 777 guy that really wanted to, he's still flying, but he's, yeah. he's going, I don't know what's going on out there, but there's, there, there are companies involved that are, they may not know exactly what's happening, but they, they, they're, they're up to no good. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So oh, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me ask you a couple of other quick questions and then you can ask whatever you want, which is um, uh, just for the record, when you were looking out through the cockpit, did you, before you got into Flat Earth, did you even think about the curve or was it just one of those things that was in the back of your head? And then when you found out about Flat Earth, did you look out the window differently? Um, actually, I never thought about the curve. <laughs> never, never. Maybe that's strange, but I, I really, I really. No, did. why? Why would you, right? Yeah, I don't know. Now but, I think it's strange, but. <laughs> but then, when you got into it, when you were looking out the window, did it look completely different to you? It was like, holy smokes! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I saw how flat it was. Couldn't, yeah. couldn't see. We have a saying here. I don't know if it's the same over there, uh, which is, you couldn't see the forest for the trees. You know, right. you, you yeah. just yeah. could not, it was like, didn't even occur to you. You looked out that window all the time for 20 something years. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, by the way, you think it's flat out there? You see it's flat? It is flat. Hola, mi nombre es Héctor Requena. Soy terraplanista desde el 2016. Este tema lo descubrí accidentalmente, me agradó mucho y desde ahí lo empecé a investigar. Desde ahí me di cuenta de lo que está pasando en el mundo. Yo fui aviador, me gusta más la palabra aviador que piloto. Yo volé con mi papá desde niño, él era piloto de la Fuerza Aérea Mexicana. Un tema muy, muy curioso que me pasó a mí fue el, el empezar a conocer cómo funciona el giroscopio. El giroscopio está diseñado para volar sobre un plano, sobre un terreno plano y una tierra que no se mueve. Todos estos temas me llevaron a, a seguir investigando, investigando. Estamos tratando de invitar a la gente a que no se cierre de mente a, a estos temas, ya que si no nos damos cuenta de lo que está pasando ahorita es por lo mismo, porque la gente está cerrada, se cierra a pensar fuera de la caja. Yo invito a la gente a que por lo menos sea un poco más abierta de mente hacia estos temas porque la verdad es que esto está muy fuerte, se vienen tiempos muy difíciles ahorita y debemos de estar conscientes de que el sistema nos está manipulando de una manera muy, muy grande. Entonces pues, vamos a ver qué pasa. I woke up to the truth of the flat earth, shape of the earth, as an engineer and a pilot. So I've studied engineering, physics, three different ways, basic physics, electric physics, and construction physics. And also as a pilot, as a rotary wing pilot, that is hel helicopter pilot, I studied aeronautical physics as well. So I can cover and discuss just about any factor of flat earth N not that i'm any smarter than anybody else but i've studied quite a bit of factors that analyze shape and motion of, of just about any object that's physics also aeronautical physics and principles of flight i can tell you this airplanes fly straight and level that's even an aviation term straight and level airplanes will fly for hours at the same altitude never dipping their nose down to follow the curve of the earth an aircraft on a 12 hour or even 18 hour flight from portland oregon to seoul korea that would have that aircraft starting at one point and then flying so far around the earth that it's 
lying downwards with its nose vertically downwards and then starting to go around around the curve of the earth so that the airplane is now flying upside down would have to make that kind of a flight path on a globe which is it's such an absurdity so that being said i come into the true shape of the earth the flat earth as a skeptic like most anyone else i'll tell you my story my buddy told me about this he said rob you need to learn about the ice ring you need to learn that the earth doesn't move this globe is garbage and i laughed at him i said are you kidding me i'm not gonna i'm not even gonna look into that he said that's fine he said that's fine you don't have to look into flat earth but if, until you do, he said, until you do look into Flat Earth, you will remain a slave of the Matrix. And interestingly enough, at this point, this was more or less November, December 2015. I had already mentally resigned from the U.S. military for three years. I had already resigned because of Benghazi. I realized and I saw for myself, I'd been working with U.S. as an army officer, working for State Department for a good 10 years. And so what I did, I turned my physics awareness, I turned my, my studies into analysis of the shape of the Earth. Radar is simply another form of radio transmission. Radio in, includes anything within the, the range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic spectrum, also known as light, Radio is the transmission of light, whether it's visible light or radio waves which are not visible. When it comes to radio transmissions, there must be a transmitter and a receiver. There can be a reflector or a transmittal unit along the way. However, in the end, there's got to be at least a transmitter and a receiver. And in the case of radar, radar transmits a signal and it bounces off a reflector and then it comes back to the receiving station or it can go to other stations if they're set up in the network properly long story short radar emits a signal it bounces off something and then it, and then it returns to a receiving unit and the receiving unit maps that reflection accordingly if there is no reflector then there's no return signal and then the object does not show up on the radar for example it's the off the screen Notice, there's no curving around anything. It goes out in a straight line. Radio signals always travel in a straight line. So the transmitter sends the, the signal out to the, the target, bounces off, and it comes back in a straight line. Radar cannot travel over the curve, and hence, radar is dependent on line of sight, direct, direct beam from the transmission to the target. It reflects, and it comes straight back. There is no curving around anything thus is radar. The fact is proven from multiple points that there is no Coriolis to the motion of the Earth. And I'm speaking from a pilot's perspective, also an engineer's perspective, because I obtained a degree as an engineer before I went to flight school. So I'm, a, I'm both a pilot engineer at once. So number one, there is no rotation of the Earth, proven by the fact that a helicopter pilot can hover the aircraft indefinitely motionless above a single point of the earth if the earth were spinning as soon as that aircraft left the ground the earth would spin out from under it now somebody may say that the air of the atmosphere rotates along with the earth which is one of the most absurd concepts imaginable because if that were the case then all wind would travel with the earth there would be no alternating wind currents when we know that the jet streams fly overhead clouds move in multiple directions overhead and a kite flying over the stationary earth the fact that a, a kite flies because of wind passing through that proves that the earth does not that proves that the air does not move in unison with the earth number two airstrips do not rotate away from a landing aircraft anybody who's seen a, a pilot's view when an aircraft lands well the aircraft lands to a motionless airstrip if the, the earth were rotating the pilot would have to turn to the angle at which the airstrip is rotating away and land at the speed of the airstrip, which is absurd, simply absurd. Airstrips do not rotate away from the aircraft, and on an east to west landing strip, if the aircraft is landing to the west, the airstrips do not land moving towards the air airplane. That's, that's insanity. 
Okay, simply stated. And I've done many of them personally. I've flown more than 1,070 hours in both helicopters and airplanes. And I will tell you factually that aircraft meet their checkpoints, they take off, they meet their checkpoints, and they land exactly as planned on a flat stationary map. No pilot, I say again, no pilot has ever, has ever accommodated for the rotation of the earth when planning flights and take off to checkpoints, checkpoints along the way, and then landing. Pilots can plan so well that they can take off and land hundreds of miles away down to within 30 seconds of their planning because the earth simply does not rotate. Uh, yes, absolutely. There, number one, there is a rate of descent, a rate of descent, and we can all imagine. These are simple concepts, and I'd like to reiterate that in all of my technical discussion, in any of our technical discussion, it needs go further than, meaning it doesn't, we need no more complexity than 10th grade science, 10th grade math, Pythagorean theorem, 10th grade physics, 10th grade chemistry, basic chemistry. This is chemistry 101, at college level, 10th grade chemistry at the high school level. One can imagine if an aircraft is flying at elevation 35,000 feet, well, it has to descend to land on the ground. Well, it's still flying in the air. It's not going to point its nose straight down and go straight to the ground. No, it's got to gradually descend from altitude down to zero. Well, we call that rate of descent. A lot of people don't talk about this. Now, I'm bringing up a new topic to Flat Earth, and I'm really bringing up a new topic to the average pilot. The average pilot does not talk about rate of descent. And how do I know? Because I've talked with several pilots and they cannot quote their rate of descent. Why do I know it? Because I memorized Army Federal regula Regulated Rate of Descent, which was 500 feet per minute. For 18 years, I memorized 500 feet per minute. That's what, for, for my first two years as an Army aviator, I memorized 500 feet per minute is the standard rate of descent. Well, that's for landing. Okay, let me reiterate, that's for landing to a full stop when the airplane wants to, to land to the ground and stop. That's 500 feet per minute. But we, in the Flat Earth community, we know that for an, air, for an airplane to fly around the globe, the supposed globe, that is, <laughs> there's a rate of descent associated with 8 inches per mile squared. So if we do the math, the 8 inches per mile squared at the average, assuming an average airspeed of 500 miles per hour of, or that's, that's really a ground speed, but, but we're, it's moving through the air at 500 miles an hour, associate that with eight inches per mile squared. Well, the math gives us the following 2,777 feet per minute rate of descent for that airplane to follow the globe. Okay, and that is right. a continuous descent, not to land. That is a continuous descent while the aircraft is at altitude flying along. Wow. Well, let's right. compare that. Let's 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 make the comparison now. Five hundred feet per minute to land the airplane at a, to a full stop at an airport. On the globe, the airplane has to descend continuously at two thousand seven hundred seventy-seven. That's that's more than five times the the rate of descent for a landing, and that's a continuous descent. So I did some more math today, by the way, Vika. Thank you for asking. It's it's average 500 feet per minute, okay? So, so I looked up gravity, 32 feet per second squared. Okay, that's that's the quote, supposed gravity, right? If you drop something it in a vacuum, okay, it falls at 32 feet per second squared. Well, let's convert that to feet per minute. That is 1,920 feet per minute. Okay, that's gravity. Now, let's remember, an airplane flying around the curve of the globe at 500 miles an hour must maintain a rate of descent of 2,777 feet per minute, which is almost a thousand more feet per minute than something falling in free fall. That's absurd. Oh that's the most absurd measurement we could have. So, 
I'm bringing that to flat to the flat earth community. That's what the math gives us, Vika and everybody else. Can we see the perspective here? The eight inches per mile squared around the curve of the globe at 500 miles an hour, that's faster than free fall. That's more absurd than one can imagine. That, it, Vika, that is the simple math. That's that's high school math right there. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been intrigued and I keep taking notes as you keep talking that uh, it, there's always this, this new, it's not new measurements, it's not new rate of descent is nothing, nothing new. new. Standard. But when you, yes, but what people seem to forget is the the globe model, the heliocentric model, that science and math is never used in a function in a functioning application. Exactly. Never, ever. Because it's so, a fraud if they ever do. Exactly. So kudos to you and rate of dissension just made my list of uh, of bullets in the gun. It that's a foundational effect of flat Earth, isn't it? It's a Amen, brother. Amen. That and elevation angles, that and, uh, you know, you, you, you triangulation. And, I mean, the list just keeps growing and growing and growing. You, and so exactly. thank you. I don't want to take a lot of time here, but thank you, Rob. Yep. And that's my point, Lon. That is exactly my point. And that's why I, that's why I send out these messages to everybody in the group so everybody can see and understand. Anybody can do this math. Pilots don't know anything out anything that's not normal they have more experience with it but doesn't just because they're a pilot doesn't mean they they know something special anybody could do this math and anybody that does this math and can explain it well they're smarter they're smarter in this effect than the average pilot amen Take it and run amen so i sat in that co-pilot seat for so many times and had i known then what i know now right. it just would have been a no-brainer I know he brought, you bring a plane up to, to elevation, to your, your, your altitude, it's locked in, and you don't bring it down until your point of destination is arrived at. It's point A to point B. That's it. And, and there is no curvature. So, all right. Uh, I don't know what to add after you guys. I'm so happy to be here. You, you guys are amazing. Um, you know what I, I noticed that... Uh, at 500 miles an hour, you, you you move about 40 miles in five minutes, and and I don't ever see any chemtrails with any sort of curved much to them. Well, and they're always straight yep. lines. Yep. So if, guess what? If you can follow a plane for five minutes. That's 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 a good amount of time. 40 miles is going to show something. Gene, I that's never... that's a prescient observation prescient not precious but a prescient but precious as well guess what my mother pointed out pointed that out to me this week <laughs> i'm not really, sure this I know week, what that my, mother, means. my own mother pointed that out so <laughs> that's awesome i have a couple epi uh the first comment by fe patriots at a speed of 500 miles per hour the plane would fly at just over eight miles per minute therefore the rate of descent in right. the first minute from the starting position is just under 50 feet and then increases. Exponentially. Yeah. 31 miles at the end of the 500 miles of its flight from the starting position. So that averages about 2,800 2, feet of descent per minute. Wow. There, wow. there you go. That, that's that's exactly my calculation. Two thousand seven hundred and seventy-seven around the globe. Exactly. Effie Patriot's but, pretty good. He's really that's good. That's all fictitious. Thank you for joining us, Effie. Fictitious. Yep. It's a dreamland. The globe <laughs> is from fairyland. Dreamland. <laughs> non sequitur. Well, uh, non sequitur. Yes. yes. And the fact that at no educational level, at at zero educational level. Is anyone ever taught the Earth curvature equation? You don't get it in, right. in, in in preschool. You don't get it in elementary school. You don't get it in middle school. You don't get it in junior high, high school, university, undergraduate work, postgraduate work, doctoral work. You, you don't, don't get even it. Talk about it because yeah. it doesn't exist. The flat Earth, the curv the curvature equation was created. By, by people who were looking for the curve. Yes, exactly. 
But you yep. know what equation they gave us that makes zero sense is E equals MC squared, and you can't and apply it. it. Yep. You can't apply that to anything in real life. That's, well, that's to support their myth of the nuclear bombs. That's all that yeah, was. Yeah, and gravity. Hocus pocus and, to cover and, hocus pocus. That's, that's hey, their magic fairy dust. Reference, reference fairyland. <laughs> we all know this. That's quote. right. I, I looked up the quote by, by Tesla on Einstein. Yeah. And, and I'll just reiterate it here. So because it was on the subject a couple minutes ago, Einstein's relativity work is a magnificent mathematical garb. This is heliocentrism <laughs> as well. Right. Magnificent medical garb, which fascinates, dazzles, and makes people blind to the underlying errors. The theory is like a beggar clothed in purple whom ignorant people take for a king. Its exponents are brilliant men, but they are meta they are metaphysicists rather than scientists. Wow. Well, there it is. Yes, well, yeah, this is my, One of my favorite quotes from uh, Tesla. Absolutely a, a great, great. They go, yeah. they Bounce That's from it. equation after equation until they get the answer they trying to. Yes. To. Oh, yeah. No, That's not part of the class understands right. anything. With Mike and Mike's call sign is is Cujo and Cujo. Mike is an F sixteen uh, fighter pilot retired. And uh, he flew F-16s for many years, and uh, he is the guy that uh, Ben initially made the video about a while back. And uh, he has decided that uh, he wanted to go public and come out, uh, you know, visual because, well, I'll let him tell that story here in a little bit. But uh, we're really glad that he has come out with us. And, uh, you know, Mike, it's really great to have you on, on Globebusters. This is fabulous. Well, geez, I, I really appreciate it. You guys... Uh... You guys are like have been my television for the last number <laughs> of years, and it's like I'm talking to celebrities. So if I'm a little nervous, like a little girl. Don't, don't make fun of me. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll try and keep that that mellow. So um, obviously, you've already you know you've been in you've been in it for a while. You figured it out a few years ago, um, and you decided recently that you wanted to go public you know because you were kind of encouraging doctors you know to speak out about what they know about the current pandemic and um you know you decided that uh you know who were you to advise them to do that if you weren't going to take steps in the same direction I mean, tell us a little bit about that yeah thanks for keeping that youtube friendly for me because i may not have been able to do it <laughs> no problem <laughs> uh, yeah i mean i think i would be a really big hypocrite if i'm uh trying to hold them to task because they don't want to blow up their gig you know my gig's kind of gone and behind me I, there's there's nothing you guys can dig and get me fired from so there you have it um uh, but yeah it's uh that's part of the part of what's held me back was uh that my wife's a professional with the military as well she's done almost 40 years and is retiring soon so um i wanted to start talking about this because there's just too many lies in the world now it just seems like everything everything is deceit and it's it gets overwhelming um and one of one of the biggest things that have been holding me back, I was talking about all the brotherhood and that from my squadron days in the past. I, uh, you know, one of the main things uh, that you worry about as a fighter pilot is not dying or anything else. It's it's looking bad in front of your buds or, you know, getting one of them killed because you didn't do something that uh, you were supposed to do or, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, Oh, there's a, I don't know, I can't think of the word now, but you understand what I mean. It's, um, yeah, there's you take a that very seriously. And, yeah. yeah, they're like family. Take very, yeah, exactly right. And I don't want to look, any of those guys to look at me and say, geez, what happened to Cujo, you know? Um, but I will tell you that those guys, to the man, were the smartest people I've ever known. And all they have to do is go down the road that I went down and they're going to be sent, sitting on this side of the screen as well because it's obvious. But the reason you don't ever look into it when 
when you're in the moment is because you, I mean, you just figure the earth is just vast, you know, you don't see curvature because it's huge, right? That's so mm -hmm. you don't ever think to question it. I, I remember, I don't know, it was probably 2015. I don't know when the, like the first basketball player, or some sports figure came out and said, oh, the earth is flat. And I'm like, oh my God. Well, I had a little bit of time. I'm like, what? <laughs> What's that? You know, so I re start to do a little research, right? Mm -hmm. And I go and guess what comes up? Flat Earth Society on the top thing. I read that. I go, well, I'm bringing more on these basketball players. <laughs> right? So about a year later, one of my daughters actually said, Dad, have you looked into flat Earth at all? And I'm like, come on. No. And she's like, oh, there's some pretty compelling stuff. I think you might be interested. And again, I had some time. So I dug in, started digging into it and actually found, I'm pretty sure I, I started with uh, taboo conspiracy stuff <laughs> and seeing too far and those things. And oh, Antarctica really that your, your video about uh, Antarctica is closed or whatever. Uh -huh. That was that was a big one for me too. But the sea too far, and I never even thought to wonder what the curvature formula is. Right, eight inches per mile squared. That ain't vast, man. The the distances that that we were working would have made a huge difference in my visual and radar presentations on a day to day basis. I know that it would have. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just can't hop back 20 years and, and put it to the test. I wish I knew then what I know now. And actually some of my goals about this is hoping that some young fighter pilot will go, oh, I'm going to check out what that old bastard says and go out and, and d do what I'm going to describe to you guys in a minute to put it to the test. I, I hope it happens. But, you know, yeah. well, guys you know aren't going to look at this or going to Google it and look at Flat Earth Society. Exactly. And that's exactly like it. We've, we've said that so many times to people that the Flat Earth Society is the first line that the uh, alphabet agencies have put out there to draw people to them. And of course, then they tell them a story that's utterly absurd. And then yeah. the reaction is that people say this is crazy. They walk away from it. They do exactly what you did. So when they got you to go to the Flat Earth Society and you walked away shaking your head going, these people are nuts. I mean, they did their yeah. job, right? So. Yeah. It's cool that your, you know, your daughter suggested that to you, and it also tells me that you know you think a lot about what your daughter thinks. You know, you obviously you have a lot of confidence wow. in your daughter. And uh, well, you I know. tell you what, man, just to put this out there, I've been so very blessed with all of my children that you know haven't been into drugs or any of the crap that a lot of people have to deal with, and. You know, my youngest now is like 32 or 33. You never keep that stuff straight, right? But mm -hmm. I'm 60, and uh, I'm. it's adult kids. You think your kids are fun when they're at a young age, but adult kids are even more fun. You know, I just love, love it. And, yeah, well, I, we listen to them, and they all, some of them think I'm maybe a little bit crazy, but most of them are going, yeah, maybe true, but I don't care. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. That's a common one that I don't care. I wonder yeah. how it's common, yeah. I, I don't understand it because for me it's like it means everything. I mean, we've been lied to since we were born. To me, it's not I don't care. That's like, you know, one of those things that yeah. we got to tell everybody. I think there's a, an element of laziness in that statement, right? I don't care because I'm not going to go digging and looking into that. Or, you know, I'll listen to you and laugh, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, yeah, my wife is buying into it and she's been in places. I mean, I am definitely not a uh, whistleblower because I don't have any more information about this than you do. No fighter pilot does, you know, except maybe the ones that some of my buds that made very high rank and. I'll leave yeah, have a security ones, clearance you know. for it yes yeah yeah that maybe no some and there are know. people in those positions that you know that have that yeah. security clearance because obviously there are people that must know they have to know yeah you know, the the whole space thing and 
I don't know. I, I, that's those are the things that make it hard for me, you know. Because yeah, I understand. It's obvious that obvious that we see too far, and the eight inches per mile squared thing is crazy. You want me to get into the radar stuff now? Um, and the reason. It, Whole actually, reason you know, I got into that, or you got some other questions? Yeah, in a minute, I, I, I want to cover a couple other things really quick first, and we'll let you kind of go through Before I that. put everybody to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. It just there's a lot of you know there's a lot of areas. Um, I have to say that uh, Mike showed us his his me room. Is that what you call it? Your me room? Your me I, room? I love me room. Every fighter pilot has one. <laughs> so that gives me credibility amongst fighter pilots right there. They know I'm not lying. I really am one because I got an island of me room. Yeah. And as you can see behind him there, he's got the F-16 things on the wall and uh, all around him. He showed us earlier all of his... Um, you know, medals and awards and training and squadron information and aircraft. I mean, everything. Wow, what a career you've had. It's absolutely uh, amazing. Was, I, would you, you mind know, covering some I would of that? Them. Would you mind covering some of your uh, um, your your education yeah, no, I, and training? Yeah. Well, in college, I uh, got really lucky. I, I always knew I wanted to be some sort of I thought I wanted to be a civilian, kind of like a corporate pilot or something like that. I wanted to fly. I've been flying since I was, I got my license on my 16th birthday. So I've been flying for as, literally as long as I I, I could have. Um, I was blessed with that and at a young age. But, um, you know, ROTC in college, there's a two-year program and a four-year program. I had longer hair back then. I almost said back in the day, but I didn't say it. Because that would be <laughs> I'm watching you. <laughs> uh, anyway, two-year program, four-year program. And I'm like, I'll take the two-year program. That, you know, Why would you do four if you can get it done in two? Well, I was talking to my advisor one day, and he goes, it was like in the end of the first semester, what do you want to do kind of thing? Well, I need to get in the Air Force and get hours so I can be a pilot, right? So he goes, why aren't you enrolled in that? I'm like, well, two-year program. No, you're not going to get a slot unless you get over there and beg to let you in on the second semester. So I got in late, and miraculously, I got a pilot slot, which, you know, there were only, I don't know, 15, I think, 15 of us that, that had them out of my college that year. But, uh, yeah, I went off to pilot training. Pilot training is a year long call it UPT, uh, undergraduate pilot training, um, in the early 80s. I don't want to narrow it down to the year because then people can look it up, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so they'll, they'll try to be as vague as possible. Yes. Yeah, I'll try to be as vague as possible. Um, but I was uh, fortunate enough to do well enough to get a fighter out of there. We only had I don't know, six, or, six or so fighter assignments out of 30 people. So I got a fighter and got my first choice. I got an A-10. So I went and flew A-10s at a very beautiful uh, location in stateside. And I uh, did that for three years and then ended up flying OV-10s, which is you get a bad deal for a good deal kind of thing. The Air Force always does that to you. Bob, you probably remember, here's a here's a shiny thing, but you got to do this thing first, right? So oh, yeah. I went and did uh, OV-10s, but I loved it. I was a forward air controller and uh so close air support was a big thing to me and uh and i learned so much even yeah. though the top speed on the on the ov10 is like the the actual airframe speed is 350 uh but you can get anywhere near that even straight downhill but anyway um from there i got my good deal i got my f-16 out of there and i did that for 12 years um, mostly in Europe, but one assignment, my last assignment was back here in the States at a at an exercise facility where I got to fly every block of model of the airplane. It was pretty awesome. Wow, that is incredible. But that's a deal. And you mentioned okay. you have actually been in combat situations as well. Is, or can you talk yeah, about any of those? Yeah, uh, I had to, uh, had the opportunity to fly in combat. I have about uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 hours and in combat had some service terror, service terror missiles shot at me but it's kind of a funny story where you know disciplined trained fighter pilots right and you would in training it's always you know if a service air missile comes up or simulator or whatever you're you're very direct on the radio like 
you know, Kucho one's defending Sam right two o'clock bearing zero four five, you know. Um, no, in the real situation, you just get on the radio and sound like a little girl and yell, Sam! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a buddy buster. Like, I, every time I talk to him, he yells, Sam! But, yeah, not my not my coolest moment ever. Ever in every situation, you want to sound like calm and collected on the radio, right? So, you know, you got an engine on fire. You're supposed to just go, yeah, uh, engine on fire. I'll be uh, ejecting here shortly. Yeah. I don't know how <laughs> I just need to there. You I, guys I have to pull in the reins on me. I'll get off on a tangent. I'm old. That's okay. I, I have no idea how I would report a, you know, like a sidewinder coming up my six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this was an SA6, and I was a little nervous about it, but I, I got even later. Oh, excellent. But okay. That's a story for another day. All right. Beautiful. So. All right, so you've been looking into this for a while, and as you told me earlier, um, you, you started in with Ben's stuff, and then you kind of came across Jaren and, and then Globebusters, and that was that was awesome to hear. And, uh, you know, I have to tell you that, that it, what you're doing here is amazing because so many people are afraid to speak out um, because of the consequences and what, you know, what they'll try to do to you. You know, you have people like Wolfie6020 out there, and... George Nutsack, you know, these people will try and go after, you know, people's careers. And it's it's horrible what they try to do. So I have to say it's very commendable. It's very brave. And, um, you know, you've already kind of a taste of that with Wolfie6020. And uh, you've had some interactions with him. Uh, and I'm just curious, you know, he, you mentioned to me earlier that he gave you a quiz. You know, he gave you his airline, you know, pilot <laughs> quiz. He thinks he knows everything. And when you answered the question, and then he came back and then accused you of simply looking it up. And it's like, well, geez, you know, yeah. anybody could have looked it up. I answered his questions right, too, but that didn't stop him from, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's no way with those guys, right? They're going to try to do you know, well, de debunked in two minutes. Uh, and by the time I left uh, Ben's chat on that video, I'm like, I'm just out of here. And then, of course, because I disappeared, it's. Oh, uh, yeah, obvious he was not a uh, whatever. You know, I'm not in a I in my previous life, I it was rare that my integrity would be called into a question. So I didn't even really consider that kind of thing. Uh, I should have. I mean, I don't believe everything I see on the internet either, but you know, whatever. But yeah. Woofy, Woofy 911 369, whatever his name is. Yeah. Well, he's like I said, paid, so. he, he is. He is a paid operative. He's bragged about it. Um, and nobody can stand him. He's a liar to the nth degree. And, you know, he's yeah. the guy that they call in when they really think they've got a problem, right? Um, yeah. And why they would, you know, we've had our interactions with him as well, especially recently with the Second Son thing. And, um, I just thought it was ironic that they would call him in. You know, it's like what? Like this airline pilot is is supposedly a expert on 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 astronomy now, and you know, um, and, and the accusations that he comes with up with are just crazy. So, I wouldn't think too much about him. And you know, people are going to look at you and they're going to judge you on your own merits and you know what they think of you, the man, and not what Wolfie says because Wolfie has pretty much shown his hand and what he is and who he is, and that's not a good person at all. Well. Well, I appreciate that, Bob. But you know, like like I said, the only there's no way to argue with those guys because any question you answer, you just looked it up on the internet, and he's not a real pilot, whatever. It's not yeah. like it's that special, you know. I was just a pilot that kind of started thinking about eight inches per mile square it ain't that big. Yeah, and and you know, it's funny though that you say that because. I didn't think that much of it either, you know, and I got my pilot's license back in 1978 also, and it was like uh, people think that, that because you're a pilot, you have this magical um, knowing, right, <laughs> yeah. about how all the curvature of the work wor uh, world works, and it's like, no, they never teach you about that in any part of flight training. In fact, everything they do teach you is directly related to a flat stationary earth from from your textbooks which literally come out and state that to yeah. your first days in your your aircraft with your flight instructor and he says see that point on the horizon out there you pick that point and you fly to it 
and you will fly a straight and level flight, you know, and it's that it's that yeah. simple. It, it is. And I remember, uh, you know, this is, I'm talking 40 years ago. I remember like the first day in academics at UPT, it was reading that statement in the book is like this all assumes a rigid aircraft, you know, flying on a stationary flat earth. And you're like, well, why would they do that? And then, then my mind goes to, well, the other stuff would just be too complicated in calculations and, you know, they can't teach that to dumb, dumb pilots. Right. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what I thought and I forgot about it. And that was that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's easy to do that. But, uh, you know, and then when you finally do realize it, you think about all of the things, all the things from flight planning, uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> whenever you set up a navigation to go anywhere, it's all based on a flat yeah. earth. I never, I never even thought about the horizon, horizon, the eye level thing was a big deal. I mean, I never thought about it, but from the first day in formation training, you know, you're looking at the other airplane and your instructor goes, if he's above the horizon, you're below him. If he's below the horizon, you're above him. If he's on the horizon, you're level. 100% fact all the time. Pitch outs and rejoins. We used to do these exercises where you're flying together and the, and the uh, flight lead would give you the pitch out signal and you'd pitch out and you'd do a big, you know, big uh, 180 degree, 360 degree turn, come back at a six o'clock and then he'd go into a turn and rock you in for a rejoin, right? Rocking his wings means come join to close with me. And fighter pilots talk with their hands, so that's more proof right there. I'm like, freaking, okay, <laughs> sorry. But, you know, the technique was put the guy about a fist above the horizon, get up on the wing line and drive in drive in level so that if you overshoot you overshoot under him or behind them right and mm -hmm. only whenever you were obviously controlled and going to move in you, then you come up to his level right right that yeah, was absolutely. that's basics and i would freaking well, oh, it's just it's just not true and all these uh, other guys were piling on and I got really upset about that. Again. Yeah. Oh, like I'm I said, I have that behind me. I'm not going to mention it one more time. Bob, that's another thing. Woofy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Japan, right. That's another topic. Screw Woofy. I'm down with that. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Hey, so, uh, hey, Mike, do you mind explaining a little yeah. bit further for someone who might not understand what that means about the horizon? The fact that uh, if a plane was above the horizon, they would be above you or below. And why yeah. this affects with respect, why it's important with respect to the flat earth. You know, I never considered even about flat Earth, right? I mean, it was just a it was just a plain fact for for us was if he is on the horizon, then you are level with him. If he is above the horizon, then you've got the horizon down there. That's level. He's above you if he's above the horizon, and if he's below, it's below. I mean, it's 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 that simple. And obviously, the implications on a flat Earth, which I never thought of until. Really, I never thought of it until I was getting all that crap from Woofy, market, market dollar. But I, I never even really considered that. It's not something I'd come across in any of the stuff that I'd watch and had been watching. But you get to thinking about it and go, well, geez, yeah, if you go up above a ball, the horizon is going to be down there. If you go right. up above well, a big, vast, flat earth, then it's going to stay at eye level because of perspective. And it does. That's right. And the thing that they, the Globers do not seem to understand about that is that, you know, they will go up higher and higher and higher. And obviously, you know, if there was a horizon, it would have to be below you. Right. But they will say because they can actually look down and see the horizon once you get up past a certain height that that, that proves that the earth is curved. But what they don't seem to understand is that there is a yeah. limit to your vision. It's a limit right? to your vision. Right. They are and, incapable and of, of understanding that. You can go on the internet and find HUD video where the horizon line looks like it's above a horizon, but it's not the horizon. It's like where the your, the visibility ends here, but the horizon it's actually the apparent is horizon. out. Right? Right. It's like a false horizon or whatever. And you can the, find those videos all day, but... Yeah, and that's the funny thing. Nowadays, you know, it used to be five years ago, we were arguing against the Globers, and they were saying 
that you know you can't see past this geometric horizon right which of course would be the mathematical place and, where the earth meets the sky and now they're saying that it doesn't even exist you can't see that yeah say, i can't no. follow that logic. <laughs> I've, I've watched those things and i've tried to piece that together and i'm like i can't follow that logic because so i know retarded. from thousands of hours of experience that the horizon is your level i mean yes. It's at high level. It's your level. Anything above it is is above you. Anything below it is below you. I mean, that's fact. So, and any of my old buds that are watching this will go, "Yeah, we was right about that one." Let me look that up. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think that's a foregone conclusion. The ballers they have to say stuff like that because you know, once the black swan came out, and I assume you're familiar with the black swan. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, that pretty much annihilated the idea of of any geometrical horizon because there simply isn't one, and it is apparent, and that's what the flat earthers have always said. And that apparent yeah. horizon, like I said, when you get up to 40, 30, 40, 50,000 feet, there will be a slight drop in the apparent horizon, but that is only because of the limitations of your visibility. and and they you know they can't comprehend that. But more importantly, as a fighter pilot, you, um, depend on that type of observation um, when you are like in combat you have like a high speed closure situation where you're coming together you said it sometimes around 1500 plus miles per hour um, you better be able to make a snap decision not only visually but uh, you know on your instruments as well to to be able to determine where that combatant is coming from yes well, and two if you get into a rolling you know dog fight or whatever you're you're dependent on the horizon you're not looking inside especially if you're defensive you're looking outside and knowing you know if he's above you if he's below you he's got if he's above you he's got more energy than you do right if you're at the same speed he's got more energy because he can exchange his altitude for, for speed uh, yes. for speed so i mean it's just it's just a fact it's just a fact <laughs> i mean I, yeah. and that's why I never even considered it like a thing, but apparently it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, that was one of the, the videos. And of course, um, Ben, I don't know if you saw it, but when he, well, I'm sure you did. <laughs> when he played your video, um, he actually ran an uh, instructional video about the particular piece of equipment um, that you were using when you were scanning with the radar. Can you talk about that a little bit? <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't know if I know exactly your question. The APG sixty eight. Yeah, APG sixty five. APG sixty eight. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I didn't know the. Yeah, I can tell you how that, how that <laughs> works. Not like from a beeps and squeaks level, but from. Oh, I, I can tell you that part of it. Part of you. Yeah, <laughs> I can tell right. you that I'll, part I'll, of I'll it. Yes. Fill in, I'm the radar guy. <laughs> uh, well, this radar on the Viper is uh, plus from it, it's got a huge scan volume, right? Plus or minus 60 of the nose, left and right, and four bars up and down. They call it plus or minus 64 bar or plus or minus 32 bar, whatever, right? So these four bars are the scanning bars, like, and I'm pretty sure, but I would have to, this is 20, even like my training in F-16s was over 30 years ago. So uh, take some of this with a grain of salt, but I'm pretty sure that, like your radar, you can see my fingers, right? Mm -hmm. the, your radar is like a flashlight beam, right? Yes. It, it radiates out. It's this slightly light. divergent. And I guess in a cone or it, really in Doppler radars, it's more like a, a square maybe. But at any rate, it's like this. And I think this is 30 degrees, mm -hmm. right? So four bar would be, it starts up here, 60 degrees to the left, scans over, 60 degrees to the right, drops down one bar, which would be 30 degrees, right? Scans back, so the bottom is basically at your nose, it's it's level if you got the L-strobe in the notch in the center. It scans back, That's so you've got the upper 60 degrees covered, right? To mm -hmm. twice at 30 degrees. Then it drops down another 30, scans back, all the way back over to right 60. Then it drops down again, scans back, to drop that other 60 degrees so I'm, I'm pretty sure it's 120 degrees this way and 120 degrees this way this way i'm not positive about but i'm almost positive okay so that's a huge search volume right that's mm -hmm. 
if you go the right and there's ranges that you set in the radar you can set it at 10 you can set it at 20 you can set it at 40 you can set it at 80 it even goes out farther than that i think 120 but it may have been once yet I, I don't recall exactly right mm-hmm. but <clears throat> we typically ran it out at 40 miles because being careful what i say a fighter size target is probably not going to show up beyond the 40 mile range okay just suffice it to say that so we pretty much ran if you're just fully scanning not really going and going to fight you're running plus or minus 64 bar both both your you and your wingman and the other element if you've got a four ship right everybody's running that just keeping it wide open when you're going into a fight though you're like <clears throat> training fights and i never was in an air to air engagement in combat that was they never they never came up to fight us i did kill some migs on the ground though in a, in a place i dropped bombs off anyway that's beside the point as well i'll go off on tangents man you gotta reel me in <laughs> that's okay hey we like hearing it you just uh you know we'll, we'll reel you in if you get too far out no problem <laughs> okay. so typically our engagements you would have the red, your adversary, we call them red air, and we're blue air. We're the, we're the good guys. They're the bad guys. They would split off, and they would go to a point at least 40 miles away downrange from you. And this is all in protected airspace, right? You would have blocks, altitude blocks. For blue air is zeros and fours. Uh, red air is five to nines, right? That means, like, from 10,000 to 14,000 feet is my airspace. There's a, it skips a thousand feet and goes five to nine. So the blue or red air is in five to nine, 15 to 19. And then it would skip another thousand feet. I've got a block up at 20 to 24 and so on. I got a block at 30 to 34 if I've got the airspace up there. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So everything all sorted out so that when we come at each other at 12 to 1500 miles an hour, then until you have complete SA on where everybody is, you don't leave your block. You stay in your block until you, if you go into a bad guy block, you got to know where everybody is, right? Mm-hmm. So whether you're fighting 2v2 or 2v4 or 4v4 or whatever, you kind of need to keep track of where everybody is. And that's the hard part. Air, air is hard for mm-hmm. a simple minded guy like me. I knew some really smart guys that could just four dimensionally fight a battle. They were awesome. I wasn't that awesome. I was great air to ground, but air to air, I was okay. I could hold my own, but it was the hardest thing. Anyway, so the radar, you get this 40-mile set, right? <clears throat> Everybody has a search responsibility. I'll just say that it's we're, we're in a 2B4, okay? Two of me versus four of them, right? Mm-hmm. We're separated by 40 miles. We're going to push, which means we're going to fights on, fights on. They, they come in in whatever formation they're going to come in. And we're going to do our tactics to defeat what their formation is. They can come into us at, you know, wide line of breast. They can come out into us in a post hole, high, low stack kind of thing, or lead trail formation. And you've got to adjust your tactics to uh, come into the murder at a position of, at a, of advantage against them so that you can kill them, right? Mm-hmm. If you can't kill them in the face before you get to the merge, which is ideal, and avoid dying by a missile in the face on the way in. And that's a whole nother story. Anyway, so because of this plus or minus 64 bar takes a really long time and we're coming at each other so fast, you want to reduce your scopes coverage down so that it covers it faster so you can find them quicker, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Simple? Absolutely. So what we would typically do is I got my wingman line of breast a mile away from me, right? He's over there. I'm over here. We split the scope down the middle. So I got plus or minus 30 here, and I'm searching, say, surface to 20,000 feet. Now that works better. I'm probably going to leave it in four bar if it's just a two ship. If it's a four ship, then we can split it into two bar, and we can search quadrants of the sky, right? So we divide the the sky up into quadrants and move the radar to where it makes sense. Okay, here's where the radar mechanics works. Because I want to search high, right? I'm just doing two bar up high. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to search from 
say we're at uh, the bottom of our block, 10,000 feet. I'm going to search 10,000 feet and above, and I want my wingman to search 10,000 feet and below, right? So you do this knob on the on the throttle. It's called the L strobe, elevation whatever strobe. You can roll the th- roll the radar search volume up so that there's a number on the cursor, right? The bottom number is the lowest bit. So I'm, if I'm searching 10,000 and above, I'm on, and I'm at 10,000 feet, then the bottom number on the on the cursor is going to say 10,000. Now it's searching up here, right? Mm-hmm. So I got 10,000 and above. So <clears throat> I don't expect to see anybody out there at 40 miles below 10,000 feet. What is that telling you now? I'm at 10,000 feet. I got the lowest part of my radar looking above 10,000 feet at 40 miles, but mm-hmm. because I just ran my cursor out there and I set it there. What happened to the curvature between me and 40 miles? I would really be searching higher than that, right? If if I set the cursor, the bottom of my cursor, le- basically level with the nose of my airplane, can you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I there. And I run that all the way out to where to 40 miles that the numbers change because the, the search volume gets bigger, but just the upper number is going to change because I've got this bottom set. Right. Right. So the, and theoretically, because, because it's, you know, 60 degrees higher, you know, so the volume is higher out there, but that bottom number doesn't change. I roll it all the way out to 40 miles. It ought to be this bottom down. Ought to be dropping That's or right. higher. Because Otherwise, if it didn't, then the problem is going to be that somebody's going to literally slip in under your radar. That's literally. exactly right. Exactly yes. right. That but doesn't happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen. And it would also happen this way, wouldn't it? When I scan out there, when I'm looking 60 degrees right, 10,000 and above, and 60 degrees left, 10,000 and above. Losing guys under over there too, right? Because it's curving this way. Mm-hmm. So I, I would have no coverage below. You know what I'm saying? I do. Yeah, and and yeah, absolutely. In other words, what they have completely failed to do in these in these situations is to um, set you up to be able to cover the curvature of the Earth. It because right. there isn't any because yeah. that would be a gross. Uh, a gross um, negligence, really. Yeah, because well, I know the radar sneak doesn't up do from this. underneath you. That's right. I know it yeah. doesn't do this, right? It right. Does and this. some people will say, well, then how come you just don't turn on your max radar all the time for full range? Well, the problem because with it that takes is way too long to get through the whole scan. Exactly. At the closer rates, then they would be in on us before we found them. That's right, because you have a you have in radar you have a pulse recurring frequency, a pulse recurring time, and depending on how those are set is what depends uh, what the maximum range of the radar is, okay, and also the resolution. You know whether or not it, you know it's going to give yeah. you data back and the response time as well, because yeah, all of that stuff takes time. You said resolution. Here's another word for you to confirm. I'm I'm a fighter pilot. Res cell guys can That's hide. Fine inside the resolution of your radar at range they can be in basically inside of one pixel right Mm -hmm. so you got a two ship coming in together and it looks like one guy and then when you get when it gets close oh no i've got two there that i was going after with this tactic and now i'm outnumbered 1v2 right yep so red cell anyway radar mechanics 101 they built it for a flat stationary earth there's no doubt about it. And my goal is for some young fighter pilot to listen to what I just said, go out tomorrow and and set your the bottom of your L strobe on your altitude, run it out there to 80 miles, and that bottom altitude on your cursor will stay the same out to 80 miles, whereas it should get bigger, right? Because yeah. the earth is curving away. That's right. Uh, Bingo. Yeah. By a huge rate, by a huge that rate. That was what I was trying to put in an email to Ben. No wonder it didn't work that way. <laughs> no, no, I understood it perfectly, but, you know, that's because I, I dealt with radar. 
So, yeah. but no, I understood exactly what you were saying, and you're absolutely right. And that that point alone um, just nails it, because otherwise okay. they'd be terribly negligent in not designing, uh, you know, having the support for you be, to be able to cover all areas. Right. Of, you know, and the other thing is, say I got a lock on a guy at 20 miles out there, and he's in the block below, block above me, right? If mm -hmm. he's in his block and I'm seeing his altitude on my radar, once I lock somebody, I can see what altitude they're at, what their airspeed is, what their aspect is, is in relation to, to me, like if they're pointing at me or going away or whatever. So if I'm looking out there and I see this guy and I've got a TD box, a target designation box comes up in the HUD, what I'm locked on, I can pull my nose to him and look out there and try to get my eyeballs on him. So, because at 20 miles, you're not seeing the guy yet. You know, you're not going to see him till probably, depending on the conditions, I don't even remember really, but probably 12 miles at the most, you're not seeing a guy out there at 20 miles. But I'll pull the a technique is pull the TD box into the guy, look and see where it is. And if you get spiked on the nose because he's shooting a radar missile at you, you can do certain, um, I have to be careful about what I said. You can yeah, yeah, certain, I understand. <laughs> you can do certain things, and now you know where that guy is and do those things in relation to where you know he is because you're going to gimbal him off your radar when you start maneuvering, like he'll get outside of that 60 degrees from you, and you got to kind of know where he was in the sky. So always, right, the guy's above me, and if he's at 20 miles and I got him locked, he's in the block above me, he's going to be above the horizon. And he always was. If he was down in my block, I'd call it knock it off because he's in my block. Right? Yep. Absolutely. There's no way around that. that. There's, there's absolutely no way around that. That is there is no way around. Dude. There's just not. And I got to thinking about that in bed one night when I wasn't sleeping, which I do a lot. Um, <laughs> I, and I and I just had to get up and email Ben the next day. I tried to get in touch with you, I think, first, but Ben was the one that responded to me finally. Maybe I tried Weiss first, and Weiss said, I don't want to talk to that guy. I got an interview. To do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that you got a hold of us regardless. So, I mean, this is awesome. But, you know, and this is something, you know, Mike, the, the good thing about it is, now that you have come forward and you know it's very clear that you are a fighter pilot i mean ben and i saw your me room it's fantastic uh, you i clearly love me know room. i love me room yes the i love me room <laughs> and and you know well we all know that i mean fighter pilots have to have an extremely high opinion of themselves they have to be incredibly confident so i get it i get the psychology i really do and <laughs> You know, yeah, but I'm not really that way. You just have to have that. I know. <laughs> but, you know, when we're all young men in our 20s and 30s, uh, yes. you know, it, yes. we're a lot cockier. And, yeah. Um, life just is ask a, my wife. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I totally get that. And, you know, watch the movie Top Gun, right? I mean, that's that's what it's about. These guys are great full movie, of Great movie. Totally unrealistic scenes, but great movie. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, well, you know, that's Hollywood for you. Yeah. But, uh but yeah, I mean, people are going to see this and they're going to say, you know what, I think it's time for me to stand up and start talking because, you know, what we're seeing going on in the world right now um, in so many arenas is it's it's scary. It just That's is my great motivator, Bob, is that I'm just tired of all the lies, man. You cannot look at anything without deception in it. And now you're mo if you look at something on Breitbart or whatever, what are they trying to feed me, you know? It's not just Democrat and Republican. It's everything. What are yeah. they trying to push me into? This whole UFO thing. Yeah, that's that's the next thing that, that I think, you know, because the elite are fully aware that we're coming, you know, the truthers are coming down on them all around them in every aspect, you know, from 9-11 all the way forward, all of these events that have happened. And so now, obviously, the next thing I have to do is something that cannot necessarily bring blame or suspicion upon them. Yeah. And that's what and bring that's what that I one think. world. The, the world has to come together to fight this common enemy thing. Yep. Right. And Reagan Werner von Braun told that told that lady that yep, Dr. Carol this Robert. is what was going to happen. It's been the plan, man. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Ben, you're smiling. What do you want? No, I was just I was trying to reel you back in. <laughs> but one of those uh, we've talked we've talked a lot about a lot of different subjects. But one of those I wanted you to cover is 
Coriolis. I've been um, doing quite a bit of research on German bombers. And one of the things, they, they calculated everything, airspeed, uh, directions, very detailed, how, you know, uh, wind speed, ele elevations, everything had to be very exact in order to drop a bomb without actually seeing the target. But one thing they never considered was Coriolis. And that's what, something I wanted you to talk about is how much adjustments did you have to make on your bombing rungs for Coriolis? You know, the uh, very first time that I heard about Coriolis was on some flat earth video. Like somebody talking about Coriolis. I'm like, what the hell is that? Coriolis. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I have dropped literally tons of bombs off of an airplane. A-10s. I've shot thousands of rockets off of OD-10s. Shot rockets off of Vipers. So I've dropped a lot of dumb bombs, right? All that stuff goes out, in the, out the window, right? When you're dropping laser LGBs, laser guided laser bombs or whatever, if you're guiding them or, uh, or missiles, surface air missiles or whatever, air to surface missiles, all that guidance stuff takes this whole argument out of the picture. But I've literally dropped tons and tons of dumb bombs. As a side note, our practice bombs are called BDU 33s. 33. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I think they're 30, I think they're 33 pound bomb dummy units. BDU 33. <laughs> 33 anyway, little dummy blue units. little blue bombs with a shotgun charge in it. And I did a lot of manual bombing in the A10. It was I was flying the A10 before before INS. I even flew some A10 before they had ILS instrument landing system, but INS mm -hmm. inertial, inertial navigation system. We had ring laser, laser gyro jets and, and some that were standard gyro, I don't know, whatever. He always wanted the ring laser gyro jets because they were supposed to be better. But still, all of the INSs sucked back in the early 80s. You had to update them or they would drift like three miles in, on a mission because you're maneuvering, you know, they get off. So you'd have mm -hmm. to fly over a known point and, and reel it back into where you, where you are. But I grew up a map to ground guy time, distance, and heading guy. Uh, so anyway, tons and tons of bombs and all different from 60-degree dive bombs, 30-degree dive bombs, 20-degree, low angle, 10-degree, and from all kinds of situations back in the day. Dang it. That's another one. Make it. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, used to think that the way we were going to go fight a war was low altitude, flying under the radar, you know, in the ground clutter so you could defeat Sams and stuff. So in the hog, in the A-10, we were low altitude kings. I mean, you could get checked out to in certain situations to 100 feet. So you're rooting around at 100 feet, low ass altitude. And a typical bombing run was done out of a pop pattern. So you would action at a certain distance away from the target you'd turn so many like 30 degrees or 45 degrees or whatever it was whatever depending on what you're trying to accomplish and pop up and then you'd have a roll down a pull down altitude and an apex altitude and you'd have to roll out right on like the numbers or you're going to miss because it's just a dumb bomb it's going to come off when you know, the geometry says it's going to hit the target and all that stuff is figured out for you. You're supposed to fly exactly the profile and be exactly on airspeed, have the pipper on the target. And, and we used to we used to have a saying, all you got to do is put the thing on the thing and press the thing. And yeah. So, so basically, Ben, what he's saying is, is that no Coriolis. there is no Coriolis. And that's <laughs> why he, he didn't even know what it was enough. until it came up. <laughs> yeah, no Coriolis. Uh, long story short, I'll shut up and quit telling my story. <laughs> no, it's true. Literally though. tons and tons and, and uh, strafe. Uh, oh, okay. That's a that's a thirty millimeter casing, right? The that's that's the A ten bullet, right? Mm -hmm. It would shoot 
Man, this is really reaching back deep into the recesses of my mind. But I, I, it would shoot like really close to 100 rounds per second. I think it was wow. 80 rounds per second. It was a eight bar- or seven barrel Gatling gun, right? So it, mm-hmm. would, it would go real fast. You could actually see the vapor trail of the bullets from the cockpit. But you could be, you could get about a 75% accuracy from a mile. And that's putting the gun cross on the target, right? Maybe correcting for a little bit of wind, but never Coriolis. <laughs> nope, never Coriolis. Long range strafe, short range, or regular strafe, low angle strafe was the ceasefire was like at 2,000 feet. So it was really fun. If you weren't shooting 100%, you weren't winning. Yeah. And uh, you you also mentioned that you've uh, flown at high altitudes as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 60-degree dive bomb, I mean, you have releases up in the mid-teens, 15,000 feet or whatever above the target. So, yeah. So what's the highest elevation you've actually flown even in the, in the F-16? <laughs> that you can admit. That would be elite. That would be elite. <laughs> um, well, fifty thousand feet is, is is the the rule uh, for Air Force pilots without a pressure suit. Um, wow, that so high! 50, so fifty thousand feet. But I actually got. To, I'm pretty sure it was fifty four. Some it was either fifty four six or fifty six four one time. And even in pilot training, I had a I had a crazy instructor. He was he was a Georgia boy. I, I loved him. He was great. In T-38s, we went up. I don't even know where we were. It had to be a cross-country or something because we didn't typically have airspace that would go this high. But we got up to, like, above 50 in the T-38, and he said, whatever you do, do not touch the throttles because if you just move a throttle, you're going to flame one out because, of you know, the air is so freaking thin. But, yeah, yeah, that high. I remember that the sky – started to take on a different kind of thing. I remember purple, but that could have been just the mm-hmm. it's kinda of like what the sky did or when, whatever, but I, it was getting it would get really dark, you know, yeah. and it kind of seemed purplish or whatever. And I always said, yeah, you can see the curve. But what I saw was the circle of my, of my vision. Your you know? vision. That's exactly. What you see. It's, and it's kind of like what we see when and, we launch yeah. a balloon up that high. You know, we it's see exactly. the the sky turn, you know, to a dark yeah, um, you know, it, was, kind of. it was really cool looking. Man, yeah. I, I tell you, I I believe that there's a, some sort of containment, I think, a firmament. Um, I remember flying out over Turkey, eastern Turkey, going into northern Iraq back in back in the day, Bob. Make a, make a <laughs> mark. I got another yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, because I owe you. Um, we would go out. It's about an hour drive from where we were and go up to about 30,000 feet as dark as it's so dark because there's no lights out in the eastern Turkey. I don't even know if they have electricity out there, but you turn off all the cockpit lights and just look up and you can see like, I don't know, I call them micrometeors at, at the time. I don't know what it was, but it was just kind of like little sparkles. It was so beautiful. And Man, I wish I knew now, knew then what I know now. Because you'd be looking at it in a whole that, different way, be, wouldn't you? Yeah, you'd be. T- it was fascinating then, and even and when you when I finally got into night vision goggles, which was later on, um, man, you see something all the time. A little, yeah, that's little crazy. Creatures. So, yeah, yeah and I, I haven't ever flown that high, but it's interesting to to hear you say that, that it looks like there's a bunch of sparkles up there because, you know, I've been looking at the firmament and I'm a big believer in the firmament. I mean, to me, there's no yeah. there's no way that it can't be there. It must be oh, there. Those, there's those m- rockets mountains of evidence for it. Yeah, yeah, there's a ton of evidence for it. And, you know, our sky is very, very much electrical. And yeah. so... Yeah, I, I just, you know, when you said that, when you have all these sparkles up there, you're probably seeing kind of like um, yeah. miniature meteor showers sort of up there, you know, up close and personal. Like, like electrical discharges, probably. Very much so. That's sort. what meteors actually are. They're not, they're not. Yeah. 
Yeah, not what you always thought. It was. No, it is not what they tell us it is. That's ridiculous. I mean, none of these meteors ever hit the ground either. And, you know, we have some of the biggest meteor um, divots, you know, on the Earth. And, and where's the meteor? They'll come up with something that maybe weighs 20, 20 kilograms or 30 kilograms. Yeah. It's like, really? Yeah. So you're going to say that this this 30 kilogram rock made this two mile? Yeah, it's, come on, give me a break. If you make the numbers big enough, you got to have to believe them. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, that's what they do. If they can't dazzle you with brilliance, they baffle you with bullshit because that is the formula. <laughs> it is, yeah. That's kind of been the way I've lived my life, but I'm not doing that now, I swear. <laughs> so, One other question I wanted to ask you on my list anyway was, was with respect to uh, low altitude flying. You've done some of that as well. And what speeds, yeah. uh, any adjustments you actually have to make for the curvature, things like that. Yeah, that gets that kind of gets me into a to a um, I'll, I'll answer your question like this. The whole argument about airplanes having to nose over to follow the curve, I, I don't like that argument because it's I can't get my mind around it because obviously I never did that. I've got three ocean crossings, OK? in the F-16, you never lived until you take a single engine airplane over the, that far over the water and you just quit looking at the engine instruments because you don't want to don't want to know. I had one oil pressure fluctuation one time that was right on the limits and it just bugged the hell out of me. I finally put my checklist in front of me and said, I'm not going to look at that anymore. But anyway, I'm answering your question, I swear. Never nosed over in 10, 11 hours of flight, right? But I think that there could be an argument that you know all altitude is is what the altitude readout on your altimeter to be in straight and level flight you're just in a pressure differential from where you took off right i mean you set an altimeter 299 or two once you get above 10,000 feet and and you fly that altitude well you always got at your cruising airspeed there's always some aoa set right uh, angle of attack so you're never nose pointing longitudinally parallel to the horizon you're usually you know in some attitude like this was a certain amount of aoa um and you know who's to say it's i'm not trimmed up to follow that pressure gradient well you know? i can i can I, tell you I, why I, I can tell you why well and, i'm sure you can bob because i have <laughs> I, I just don't I, like the argument because it i can't get my head around it and argue it concisely right right well I'm sure first of all the reason that you never, you know, had to make the adjustment for it is because it's, it's not the there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I get that's, that. I know that. That's <laughs> that's the no-brainer part of it. Um, oh, I get now, it. Secondly, the, the gyroscopes, the gyroscopic claim to fame is, of course, rigidity in space. And, yeah. uh, of course, you know, and I did this. I actually took a gyro on a plane uh, commercial flight to Maui from Denver, right? And I think I calculated something like uh, 35. I can't remember what it was, that it should have actually... Uh, rolled over um, or processed, and of course it didn't because. But it, and yet you can you can put them on like a seven day recorder, uh, which is something as low as a one point two degree per hour, um, you know, change of angle. And and of course, remember they're trying to tell us that gyroscopes. Well, they're never sensitive enough to pick up the fifteen degrees per hour. Not only is that complete nonsense, but we were actually able to do it at one point two degrees per hour, and we did it with incredible accuracy. So, regardless of you know whether or not you would notice it or or you would see anything in your uh, rate of climb indicators, um, the gyroscopic the the gyroscope is going to register that pitch change point blank. There's no way around. Yeah. Well, I, I I agree with you. I mean, the flight path marker is on the horizon whenever you're straight and level, and it was there all the time. And you know, I've got attitude hold on. So let me go further with my answer to this question, though. Okay. I see where this comes into play at low altitude over the water, very low altitude over the water at high speeds. And I have been there. I have done. I have done. Very low altitude above the water in protected airspace or northern Iraq. <laughs> it's okay. near the Mach, 0.95 Mach. And I feel that if you were flying at 
nine and a half point nine five Mach is roughly nine and a half miles a minute. That was our planning factor. Mach one is ten miles a minute. It's not really, but it's close. Um, so at nine and a half miles a minute, I think I probably would have had to be a little bit light in the seat to stay very low, right? Yes. To yes. hug the water, and that didn't happen. And that, and I did that for quite a quite a while over over a lake for probably 20 miles yeah some some poor hapless fisherman that happened to be in my flight path <laughs> probably <laughs> suffered for it and to him i apologize <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm actually going to share a screen on this because we we did this earlier let's see there's that okay now this this is something I showed you earlier, and I actually did this um, a demonstration uh, using the Boeing 737's cruise speed, right? And if it flies for one minute, um, basically it goes 8.6 miles. Uh, the curvature z-axis in that that one minute it drops 49 feet. Um, z-axis in miles 0 0.0094. Basically, I just put it on there, so the average foot per minute drop would be 49.8336, right? Then I decided to do it. Well, let's just uh, double the speed of that because it just so happens that if you double the speed of a 737, it turns, out, it turns out to be exactly the rotational speed of the Earth, right? And of course, you can see what happens there. But the big thing is that when you start looking at these things, you know, going over uh, a certain amount of area over so much time, you know, we're looking at an average here. Note it says average foot per minute drop. So if we're going, if we go 15 miles, we're getting a 747 per foot per minute average drop. And yeah, I'll 15, tell you what. 15 you, minutes, yeah. That's, yeah, that's insane, right? There's no yeah. way that you would never be able to. Now, average would also mean that you would have to have a lot lighter than that. But at some point, as you're going over, right, you're going to be coming, you know, damn near straight down, or it would seem like it. Um, and so... This is actually how the math works out on the z-axis. And we know this doesn't happen, but yet right. the geometry absolutely demands it. So now what they're doing is they are coming out and they're saying, well, then, then what's happening is the eight inches per mile squared is not accurate. And the problem with it is, is because it is being calculated based on a parabola. And of course, my response to that is, let me go back over to here is this okay so uh, you know and in fact uh, dave weiss is having a discussion uh against some scientists physicists with uh eddie bravo and you know he said well what do you do with these people they're denying uh, all of the eight inches per mile square measurements and i told him i said david just tell him to do the math and then to tell him what he gets ask him what he gets for these distances as far as curvature and you can compare it then to three different methodologies that I put out here, uh, eight inches per mile squared using the Sagita um, or AutoCAD, okay? And as you can see, these things are all really good. Even if you go up to 500 miles, 31.53 uh, miles, 31.57, 31.7, it's just a couple of tenths off, right, as far as curvature. So it's good now at 500 miles, even at 1,000 miles, we're no more than a mile off, right? So they cannot, they cannot deny this. I mean, it checks out in every conceivable mathematical uh, permutation, right? It just, you know, it just is what it is and you cannot take that away from it. And so now they're trying to, first they denied that, you know, the horizon existed, right? The geometric horizon, well, you can't see it. Now they're denying the eight inches per mile squared. Well, then all I, all I can say to that is then tell us what it should be and prove it. And they'll never be able to do that, right? So that's why, you know, I, I just think that it's amazing the excuses that they come up with, right, to try and shut these arguments down. But, you know, that is what this is based on just simply by the eight inches per mile squared. And when you look at these numbers, of course they're absurd. They're absurd because we're not on a globe because to even remotely come to anywhere near these foot per minute drops over this period of time is is complete ludicrous, right? It's lunacy. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I say to that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I, yeah I, don't dis I don't disagree with you, that's for sure. It's just a really hard thing to get your mind around, but it, so is 
the air being stuck to the spinning ball in the column all the way to infinity. That's another one. I mean, how did I ever believe that? I yeah. mean, <laughs> Lord. And, and every time it's ever put to the test, it always comes up the wrong direction, oh, right? Gravity. It's just yeah. gravity. Well, it's gravity. Yeah, it's well, amazing. It's like gravity. So, so yeah, so that's, you know, that's what I have to say about it. And I'm really happy, you know, that you have come forward and, and, you know, talked about this because this I'm sure is going to motivate other people to come forward and, you know, maybe even. Well, I hope so. De depends on what happens to me after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the trolls uh, are going to be the trolls are going to do can, their job. Dude. But there's uh, nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do really other than, you know, they, they can preach to their choir and their choir can say, rah, rah, rah. Yeah, that guy's, yeah. That guy's no pilot, guy's no way. Man. Yeah, he's a no dumbass. He doesn't pilot. have any idea. Pilots aren't that stupid. They're not that ugly. They're not that short. <laughs> They're really not that fat. Well, I wasn't a pilot. I wasn't fat for 20 years ago, so leave me alone. <laughs> um, there is one more thing that I want to cover before we okay. break this up. And this is not going to be popular with everybody, but I have good news. There is really good news about chemtrails. Every single chemtrail that you see in the sky isn't necessarily spraying on you because I can tell you for 100% certain, contrails are a real thing. I don't know that I think some people, the way I hear them talk and, you know, I see them in chats or whatever that. Oh, they're just spraying everywhere. It's not always spraying. I've made lots of them. Forecasters predict and predict at what flight level they'll be because we need to avoid them. Like in, in those air-to-air -air setups I was talking about before, you don't want to expose yourself at 50 miles so a guy can just go, oh, there he is. Exactly. You know, they're not even having a radar lock. They, they see you. So we make contrails all the time. My only point is every mark in the sky that you see there it's not necessarily spraying i know that they they're they've admitted we've seen they do but not everything is so maybe that takes a little bit of pressure off of that and i feel like i would be remiss in not in not saying that because i've made contrails myself that's that's good and actually that makes sense and obviously the contrails have have everything to do with temperature and humidity um, and the interaction of the exhaust with it. And you're right, you know, not well, every mark up there is a contrail. Well, I mean, and I'll leave that, it to Bob to break it down to know exactly what causes it. I just know my hot <laughs> stuff coming out the back, it makes clouds. That's all I know. That's right. Yeah. But you're right. It, it's not 100% all the time. So uh, I agree with you completely on that. And, and, you know, people do get a little bit overzealous, I think. Um, you know, they'll point, they'll see that and they'll go, oh, God, they're they're spraying. And it's like, well, no, not exactly. And, uh, you know, to me, you know, I've looked at them for over 20 years now, and there's a distinct difference. Um, there's a, to me, the, the real ones, the authentic ones are very obvious, um, but not everybody really looks at them the way I do, I suppose. So but, I live uh, out here in the middle of nowhere, so they don't spray. They don't bother spraying me. They already yeah. know I'm whacked <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and anyway, I still have. I I yeah, it's good, and, I, and honestly, I still haven't figured out exactly what the whole purpose behind that is. I mean, there could be several reasons for it. Um, I still tend to believe it has something to do with um, creating an ideal medium for holography, but you know, I could be completely wrong on that. But at this point, I just don't know. So I'll leave it at testing that. Testing things too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. There's, yeah. Well, Kujo, I got to tell you, man, uh, I really appreciate it. And I hope, you know, maybe we can have you join us on a, another show sometime. We'd love to have you come on Globebusters and maybe join a panel one day. Or, you know, I'm you nowhere know. near smart enough for Globebusters. Come on. <laughs> uh, no, I, no, no, no. I listen to, to Wits It Gets It, man, and that dude is, he is on <laughs> another level for me. Yeah, he is. You He's, too, uh, really. I think Ben and I might be able to have a conversation yeah. over in the corner. Oh, hey, as long as he doesn't start talking lawyer on me, I mean, yeah. Ben's no dummy either. Believe me, I think, I think all the guys on the Globusters team are pretty smart. So it's a it's yeah, a good, just, good group of guys. <laughs> so I awesome. agree, hundred percent. I I was laid up for a few years um, and was able to deep dive into things. I caught up on a lot of episodes of Globusters and all of Ben's stuff. 
that was uh it was a good opportunity. So you guys, like I said, were my TV for a number of years. <laughs> so I've been talking to my celebrities. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are and certainly- it's, been, it's been so awesome to talk with you, Mike. And thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I actually feel bad for the coming trolls that are going to be attacking you. And all I can say is I'm yeah. sorry, but it's not my fault. I, but to- <laughs> I, I know it's coming, but I'm, I probably won't even look, to be honest. So they can knock themselves out. I'm, I don't care. I'm not going to look. I know my truth. I know you. I know you guys know who I am. So yes, and we do. We do too. We we got the grand tour, and there is no doubt in my mind you are exactly who you say you are. <laughs> None. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. That's awesome. All right, beautiful. Well, I guess we'll just wrap it up then on that, and uh, and Ben can do his magic with this thing, and we'll put this thing out. I I think Ben, what he usually does is. He'll uh, do his editing, and if we add any, you know, add anything to it, and then he'll run it by you to make sure that everything is cool in there, that you're, you know, uh, agree with all of it, and then well, we'll, we'll I'll be honest. It. Right now, I don't see much there to edit. I mean, it's kind of I, I like it the way it is. I mean, I is, do too. Is, it's pretty good. Is there anything that you you said in this that you would like me to yeah, re-examine? To back think back in the day, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> add a couple of back in the days in there just to get it up to yeah. 10 bucks yeah i'll be looking yeah. for those donations what, on rockman what, so. was the, what was the total i, I if, if you don't call me out i'll be pissed yeah. there's only the three of them there's only three of them so there you go well, three back in the day and two woofies yeah two woofies. all right okay. so i owe you five bucks you want right. fair enough all right man and it's my honor to talk to you guys i i don't want to stop because i never get to talk to anybody about flat earth as, as a matter of fact i try to go as much time as possible without seeing another human being other than my brother and my wife so you know i i don't get off the farm very often these days yeah i understand well you know what you have my you have my phone number and skype and you know feel free to contact me anytime you'll, and you'll uh, be sorry uh, bob i'm gonna be calling <laughs> you up hey, bob, i was thinking about this thing the other day Or is it global? It's flat. Yes, it's flat. Thank you very much, mate. God bless. <laughs> A man asked the pilot if the earth is flat. Can I talk to the pilot, please? He's right here. You're the pilot? Hi. How long have you been flying for? Uh, like, for Delta, 21 years, but maybe like 30 something. I want to know, um, because they say the pilots know a lot. Do you uh-huh. think the earth is flat or no? <laughs> I know it's flat. You know it's flat? <laughs> How long have you been flying for, you said? Over 30 years. And when people, when you tell people that, do they think you're like crazy or no? Only one person. <laughs> Only one person? Yeah. Are you yeah. a pilot? Yes, sir. One question. Okay. When you descend in the air, yeah. do you dip or do you go straight? It's straight. Straight? A little more with the nose up. That's, but, that's it. But straight. straight. You don't dip yeah. into the... No. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you're you. You're welcome, sir. All Have right. a great day. Did you notice any curvature while we were up there? Curvature? No. No? There's no, no curvature? It's just all flat. The pilots. Is the earth flat around? Flat. Thanks. I'm with you. Because they're telling us, you know, that at least in the U.S., the ground's moving at about 700 miles an hour left to right. And I was thinking that's kind of odd if you're landing going north. You know, are moving in the north direction. That's not, and that, yeah, no, the ground looks to us like it's standing still. Yeah, not an issue, huh? Yeah, no. You could probably see the Rockies from Kansas. Wow. Clear. It's a clear day, but if it's smoky or hazy, obviously we can't see. Excuse me, guys. Hey. I have a question for you. Yeah. One of us can answer it. Maybe. Do you guys adjust for curvature as you're flying through the air? You know, the earth is supposed like, to be a ball, right? Yeah. yeah. So should we be dipping down the nose of the plane to compensate for the curvature? Or do you guys just... It's a long answer. Or do you fly on a, over a flat plane? Well, we're about a millimeter of a, over a bowling ball. We're not that that high. Eight inches per mile squared is the official uh, story of what the curvature drop should be. So a distance that far, should, if you're uh, you know, eight inches from the shore on a beach and your friend is rowing his boat yeah. out one mile away, the boat should be already hidden by the curvature. You guys don't We'd, see curve, you see horizon at really, eye level. No, I mean, we, if you look at more of a 
this curvature of the earth, and we're on you know the perpendicular, we're just on that tangent. So and really, that, that we're never, and that never changes. Yeah. Earth's flat. Sorry. Earth is flat. Yeah, well, we know that. We've seen it every day. Flat and stationary. <laughs> exactly. Everybody else. Well, you know, know that you guys see the horizon at eye level, and you have to understand that if you're on a ball, as you rise from the ball, you would have to look down to see the horizon. Yeah. You don't ever see that. I look out the window of the plane and I see horizon as far as I can see, flat. Looks different from the front. Even from there. Your windows aren't any, aren't that much different. <laughs> it's, Earth is flat. It's, it's a big lie. You guys should look into it. You know it's flat. You guys fly over it every day. We're not allowed to tell anybody that. I know. Do you say is that it's flat? Yes. Yeah? Thank you very much. Is there any more pilots up here or is it just you? Just me. Just you, I got a quick question for you. Yeah. When you're up there, come on, with you. Come on cruising altitude, uh -huh. do you all have to adjust for any curvature of the earth while you're up there? <laughs> Great question. I know. You don't? But I know. Because my understanding is, is you're like on pretty much like a parallel sort of fl uh, flight uh, other than enough? takeoff and landing, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's more vertical. So we're not curving at all. So we're just going straight up, like 40, 20 degrees maybe. Right. Level off, and uh, I never thought about how the atmosphere works with the curve in the Earth and all that stuff. Well, if you think about it, I've done some uh, research on it. It actually, there's a formula, eight inches per mile squared is what the curve is supposed to be, spherical trigonometry. And if, if it was actually that formula, we would have to dip the nose a half a mile every minute to stay around the ball. So I just wanted to ask you, as someone who's up there, we, the plane doesn't do it automatically. You're not adjusting anything, right? No, no, no. It's yeah. just flying no straight. We even talked about it in 30 years I've been flying. Yeah, it's, what, it's funny to so think about. So maybe the gas has moved with it. Yes. Well, that's what I've heard as a, as a working theory. Is some people think that gravity or does something for you. But, I mean, I guess the common question goes back to is, like, how many parallel flights does it take for you to get to go around in a circle? Very you know what I mean? Yeah, Take a look into it. Yeah, we're gonna start doing that. Yeah, yeah. all right, man. Have we'll a good one. It. Hey guys, you mind if I ask a question real quick? Yeah, sure. So, when y'all are flying up there, do yep. you account at all for the curvature of the Earth? Uh, well, we do when we do what we call uh, getting direct. Our navigation system uh -huh. off of. Uh, uh, we have IRS's internal, re uh, internal revenue uh, initial <laughs> reference system. Just do your taxes? That the uh, airplane, it can do itself. It so it matter. does it itself. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter if we lose our GPS's, but but we also use GPS satellite and right, we right. use ground based. And when we go direct, we no longer fly direct to a point we arc because, believe it or not, because of the marble, right. it's closer to arc. To a point than it is to fly straight. So if the Earth is twenty five thousand miles in circumference, we have a curvature of eight inches per mile squared. I'm gonna take your word. Ride on with that. me. I believe you. If we're riding at about five hundred miles an hour, roughly thirty five thousand feet, in order to stay over that, the plane would have to dip a half a mile a minute. Do you know what that would feel like up here? Uh, no. It would feel like a lot of dipping. Are you like uh, gonna like launch satellites when you uh, or do you do? No, that but I know people would actually launch. High, we at we launch uh, high altitude balloons. Very cool. One hundred twenty thousand feet, level plane. So say that again. The, in yeah. order to stay at the same altitude. Right. So if it's a uh, twenty-five thousand mile circumference ball, eight inches per mile squared is the formula. It's spherical trigonometry. You have to kind of go do the math to make sure it works out. But if you're traveling at that speed, we would have to dip a half a mile a minute just to stay over that. So it would honestly be like we were kind of yeah. dipping all the time. And as you all know, the nose is slightly up, sure. flying level. So my question is, is like how many level flights does it take to go around the ball? We're not curving on the way to France. We're not curving on the way to New York. <laughs> we are. Are we? Yeah. Yeah, dude. It's, I mean, the forces equal out, right? Like the accelerant. Gravity, the gravitational force. All right, now is the plane doing it or is gravity doing it? Because now we got two different things. I'm I mean, saying gra <laughs> I mean, gravity. All right, one more and I'll let you guys go. The Earth is moving at east to west, a thousand miles an hour, right? I'll what's take it, your word for it. What's it like landing on a runway north and south if that runway is moving 1,000 miles an hour east? Well, we're, yeah. moving, we're moving 1,000 miles east. We're moving with the Earth? So the only thing independent of the Earth's spin is sniper bullets, not balloons and airplanes. <laughs> Think about it. I love it, man. Think about it. <laughs> All right, bro. It, your experience will tell you, you you're flying over a stationary plane. Just forget what you're taught. Just get the wheels turning. Y'all have a good day. <laughs> See you, man.
Um, did you notice any curvature while we were up there? Uh, no. No? What did you, you see while we were up there? Uh, this is the blue sky, white clouds. Yeah, is it flat or? Pretty flat. Pretty flat? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Captain, you know what? Someone wants to say hi, is that okay? Oh. Do you adjust for curvature when you get up to a certain altitude? Well, yeah, if you're, when you see the sun coming up on the horizon, that'll help you well. But the, the plane stays at an even pitch throughout the whole flight? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not, not too much curvature to account for? Nah, no. More flat than anything? No, if you close your eyes, you won't have a clue. True. More flat yeah. than anything? What was that? It's more flat than anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Flat or a ball? Flat. Lots of ball. <laughs> I think it's flat. Yeah, me it's too. Pretty flat to me, it certainly does, doesn't it? And you, you, you've got that flight in. Excuse me. Do you mind? Hey, how are you doing? Very well. How are you? Good. So you know how we just took a flight of descent? Yeah. Um, did you have to compensate for curvature? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So did you just have to compensate? for curvature due to the flight of descent as no. we landed just now. No, not necessarily. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. You bet. So the pilot just told me that the earth is flat. <laughs> hey guys, I just wanna say thanks for the right. smooth flight. All right. I have think I have one question. Is there like a specific angle of downward tilt you have to fly at? To three degrees. Three degrees for the curvature of the Earth? Oh, for the Earth? Because yeah, no, we just fly over over the troposphere. Really? Yeah. But yeah. Do you have to keep like kind of going down because? No, we actually have to nose up. Is it flies? Yeah. Really? Because I was reading some stuff on the flat earth that made a lot of sense. Have you looked into it? This one? This one? Sorry. On the, I was reading a lot of stuff on the flat earth. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. True, true. It's true? Yeah. Okay, yeah. alright, cool. All right. All right. God bless, brother. Alright, have a good one. You too. I'm a fellow, uh, Casey Josh, I'm a fellow, just PPL, hello, oh, pilot, cool. here. Yeah, it's nice. I got a couple of serious questions to ask okay, you. Okay, here we go. Yeah, there's a bit of time. <laughs> Kivacha. Curvature. Yeah. Yeah. We don't allow for curvature, do we? Yeah. <laughs> for anything, not for you usually. Yeah. No, we're we're round. Uh, we're a disc, aren't we? Round I'll just flat. Sneak past yeah. You, sorry. Hey. Look. Honestly. Quite seriously. Yeah. We are, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Can I ask them a quick question? Um, no, sure. Excuse me. Thank you, quick, quick question. Of course. Do you guys account for any curvature of the earth? Do you guys float, uh, fly with the, the nose down or anything? It's actually a good question. And these boxes that are here actually do compensate for that. We don't do anything about I mean, uh, okay. it is in these, these two boxes. Oh, because I... They actually do compensate for that. Really? Because I've read that these guys it's, actually fly with the nose up. It is. It's up about anywhere from one and a half to about two So you fly with the nose up? Yeah. So Not, I mean, you know... One and a half to two degrees is yep. not much, but it is up. But that, so that means there's no curve, because you would be fine with the nose down. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, it's at its movement, but you yeah, guys, that's, that makes sense. You guys know. You guys know it's so flat, the, right? The 78, right? So what's 78? The 787 actually flies flat, though. Okay. So the 787 yeah, flies flat, but you guys fly with the nose up. On this? Yeah. Well, not every single minute, but yeah. If we're accelerating, it's flat, right? Yeah. Right. All the time. About all the time. So there's nothing being compensated at that. Never point. nose down. Uh, only when we're descending. Never nose down. Yeah. I mean, we do come nose down. When you come, when you have to come down. Yeah. But if the if the Earth was a globe, you'd have to be nose down all the time, right? <laughs> You're asking. Like so it, I, like I, it I, mean, more less nose up. Yeah, I don't know if I have yeah, you, you guys are nose up. I appreciate yeah, you getting yeah, the safe yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Bet, thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Woo! I am so glad you could join me. Now, this started off with a message from James Hollywell. He wanted me to look at a video of an SR-71 pilot claiming to see more than he should be able to see if the Earth was in fact a ball. 
And I told James after watching the video that I would just I would need the pilot's name and I would need to verify this story simply because in the past I have used other people's information and found it turned out to be false. And I don't want to mislead anybody, folks. So I super, super double check now <laughs> before I make any video. And so uh, James went to work and I went to work and he found the pilot name and I went to where he got the article at Aviation Direct Easy Plan. And I said, this story, a real account from a real SR-71 pilot are just a spoof. And I got a reply from a pilot, Jeffrey Peterman. He says, real deal, story from SR-71 pilot, backseater did all the talking. And so then I just replied, thank you very much, Jeffrey, amazing aircraft. And so now I'm going to play you the part of what the pilot says, and then we're going to analyze his distances and show you that, in fact, the Earth is not a globe. Air Force Major Brian Schull is a pilot of the SR-71 on this day, and his co-pilot is Walter, who is in the back of the plane working all the radio equipment. And so I checked this out on Air and Space uh, to get the pilot's name and to verify the story. Be an SR-71 pilot. When Walter and I were doing a training mission around the United States where you just were building up hours and time and we take off out of Beale, hit a tanker in Idaho, rip on up to uh, Montana, zip across Denver, hang a right turn in Albuquerque, out over Los Angeles, up to Seattle, back into Sacramento, two hours, 21 minutes. <laughs> and you just do that for, then you do it backwards and you hit a tanker. Too. It was just, just to gain crew coordination, get build your hours. We're on our last training mission. We're over Tucson. I can see downtown LA from Tucson. We're at 89,000 feet. I can see the whole western United States bathed in a warm October fall glow. SR-71 Air Force pilot Brian Schul states that he was flying above Tucson, Arizona at 89,000 feet, and he was able to see Los Angeles and the whole western seaboard. Now, of course, this is not possible if the Earth is, in fact, a spinning ball because Brian Schull's max view distance would have only been 365 miles, Los Angeles being covered up by 9,970 feet of curved Earth. Let's continue. I can see the chain of Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico. I can... Oh, what was that, Brian? Did you just say you could see all the Rocky Mountains from New Mexico to Canada? I can see the chain of Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico. I, can... I guess Brian did say that. So, from the tip of New Mexico to the very edge of Canada is 1,150 miles. Now, I'm assuming Brian was still flying over Tucson when he saw the Rocky Mountains, but even if he wasn't and was in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, his max view distance would not allow him to see either New Mexico or Canada simply because the Earth is supposed to be curved. If Brian was still flying over Tucson, Arizona, and saw the Rockies extend from New Mexico to Canada, that's 77 miles of missing curved Earth. If he was in the center of the Rockies, he still only has a max view of 365 miles at 89,000 feet. Folks, throw your globes in the trash, wipe the tears away. The Earth is flat, proven by the United States Air Force.